Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to call to order the Committee on Economic Development. So this is um, an issue near and dear to, to many of us, obviously those in the room, um, one that's been tackled in the past by, my, uh, by EDC and by the council, but it's a good timing to look at what's going on again in the state of the city, especially after our most recent tragedy. Uh, but this hearing was scheduled prior to that, and we wanted to take a look at safety regulations throughout the city. So I will start with our statement, and then we will swear in our, our members of the EDC. So good morning, everyone. Uh, today is Wednesday, April 18th. My name is Paul Vallone, and I have the privilege of chairing this committee. Today, right now, I'm joined by Council Member Peter Koo. Some of our other members, uh, there are many hearings going on today. We'll be popping in and out. The purpose of today's hearing is to call on the EDC and the city to create an updated helicopter master safety plan for the tourism and charter helicopter industries that operate in our city. We must re-examine the safety protocols that are in place, operating guidelines and operating agreements with the FAA and control of operation and maintenance of our existing helicopter system. The most recent tragedy occurred on March 11th involving the Liberty Charter Company that killed five people have left us all with unresolved and unanswered questions. Basic safety standards must be re-examined and determine what agency is supposed to enforce them. In fact, the entire helicopter industry that does business in our great city must be called into account for their existing operating guidelines and safety protocols. We understand that the NTSB is still conducting their investigation as the exact cause of the crash, but we must make sure that a tragedy like this never happens again. Just today, the city's Economic Development Corporation, who's here, in conjunction with this hearing in our office, has announced new safety standards prohibiting the use of doorless flights in the down, from the downtown heliport. We applaud, as everyone else, this great first step and look forward to working with the EDC on creating an overall safety plan for helicopters that fly in and out of New York City. However, more needs to be done. Every day our residents must endure the constant onslaught of helicopter and aviation traffic and noise over their homes while their quality of life is continuously eroded. Particularly in Northeast Queens, in my council district, there's been growing in a seemingly endless attack by low altitude charter helicopters flying just above residential rooftops just about every three minutes at all hours of the night. Frustrations with the 311 and the EDC complaint systems have led our residents to create private websites such as T Stop the Chop, which tracks complaints about helicopters and identifies where the complaint occurred. It is a shame that we need to rely on local residents for this information when the city is more than capable of collecting it. These complaints are by no means confined to my district, and this is most certainly not a new problem. Since at least 1999, the city has made sporadic attempts to address the quality of life issues created by persistent helicopter noise. At that time, former Mayor Giuliani commissioned a study that ultimately determined that sightseeing flights should be prohibited from all city-owned heliports. At that time, the city's power to regulate helicopters was limited due to a number of outstanding agreements with operators at these heliports. It took a little over a decade for these agreements to be ultimately sorted out, but since 2010, the only heliport that has operated sightseeing tours has been the downtown Manhattan heliport right here in Lower Manhattan. Since then, the city has worked with the EDC, the Federal a Aviation Administration, and helicopter tour operators to alleviate noise produced by sightseeing helicopters. This was achieved via route changes, restrictions on operational days and hours, reporting on deviations from agreed upon routes. Many of these concessions were secured through nego negotiations with my colleagues and the council right here in 2016. Notably, council members Menchaca, Rosenthal, and Chin, whose constituents experienced an outsized impact from sightseeing helicopters. I commend them for their efforts in reaching those milestones. However, much work needs to be done for the residents of Queens, Brooklyn, and Mat Manhattan who still suffer from the consistent noise produced by charter flights. While the FAA has approved route changes for sightseeing helicopters in the city, for the chart and for charter flights over Long Island, it has not addressed the ongoing concerns from residents who live in the areas of New York City who suffer from noise produced by those same charter flights. Senator Chuck Schumer, former Representative Tim Bishop, have worked with the FAA to amend the so-called North Shore helicopter route in 2008. Since then, charter flights between New York City and eastern Long Island must fly over the water at Waypoint near Huntington in Suffolk County, roughly 20 miles east of LaGuardia Airport. This is simply unacceptable for the residents of Queens and Brooklyn, who still deal with the loud, low-flying aircraft at all hours of the day and night. For these reasons, we've sponsored Resolution 178, along with my fellow Queens Council Member Costa Constantinides, calling on the FAA to amend the North Shore helicopter route to extend the water requirements further west to cover all of Northeast Queens. 
I do not believe the FAA is in attendance today, but I hope they are willing to come to the table in order to alleviate the concerns raised by all of the residents of Northeast Queens. And may I add, with Northern Nassau County, who deal with these noise on a daily basis. The committee will also be hearing a pre-considered introduction sponsored by Councilmember Machaca and myself, which would require the EDC to develop and continuously update a helicopter safety and sightseeing plan. This plan would create clear objectives for reducing noise, improving air quality and public safety in relation to sightseeing helicopter tours and regular progress reports for furtherance of these goals and charters. We recognize that the EDC's direct authority with respect to achieving these goals is restricted. However, we hope the EDC will work with the community advocates and consult with the FAA, the Port Authority, and the operators near the city in their efforts to develop these goals, particularly in light of what happened on March 11th with the Liberty helicopter crash in the East River. We hope the EDC will take this opportunity to conduct a complete safety review with helicopter operators on their choice of safety gear when developing the sightseeing helicopter plan required by this legislation. Again, while the NTCP is, NTSB has not concluded its investigation, all signs point to this being a preventable tragedy, and we implore helicopter operators across the tri-state area to take note and reconsider their safety equipment and procedures. With that, I would like to thank the committee staff, Legislative Council Alex Polinoff, Policy Analyst Nadia Johnson, Finance Alice, Analyst Alia Ali, for all their hard work in putting this together. I think we've also been joined by Council Members Lander, Richards, Menchaca, and Chin. And with that, we could swear in. And Council Member Chaka, we have opening statement. He's here. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just want to say Sorry, a few yeah. words uh, as we start and just really thank the leadership of Chair Vallone. His statement really opens the conversation of our many chapters of Saga in this helicopter policy conversation here in the city. And I'm happy that we're having this conversation. The public uh, deserves answers, information, understanding, and to be heard. And that's what we're here to do. I understand that there might be workers in the room, helicopter industry folks. Um, we welcome you in this discussion. We are not starting this anew. This is something that we've been talking about in this last session uh, with multiple pieces of legislation that the New York Post false, falsely claims that failed. In fact, I think we went forward in some of the things that we're going to be reviewing today to see how much forwardness we, we actually took. Um, the last thing I want to say is that part of what I want as a council member and a New, York, New Yorker is a real sense of collaboration, uh, partnership with everyone. We as the city, as the chair said, don't have, a, don't have too much uh, in the wake of, of um, what happened with the helicopter uh, uh, crash, a lot of power, which means that we need to bring more partners to the table, and that requires the federal government. This requires all of us to come to together, to collaborate, to partner. And what I feel like it's been before is more like negotiation. But we can't necessarily feel like negotiation is going to answer the issues around noise and pollution uh, and safety. And so that's what I'm hoping this hearing will get us to. Uh, and I'm really proud to be with Councilmember Chin and Rosenthal and Al Vallone in this effort. And there are others who will be joining us. So I look forward to the testimony uh, from EDC and, and uh, look forward to the conversation ahead of us. Thank you. And thank you for your legislation, Councilmember Chakra. We're happy to we'll co-sponsor that. So with that, I'd ask the members of EDC to raise their right hand. Do you swear to affirm, to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today to respond honestly to council members' questions? Thank you very much. And if you'd like to begin your testimony. Uh, good morning, Chairman Ballone. I'm David Hopkins. I'm the Director of Aviation at the New York City Economic Development Council. Pleased to speak, oh, closer. <laughs> pleased oh, to, pleased to speak to you and your council colleagues today uh, about uh, the helicopter tourism industry. I'm joined today by Alexander Brady, who's our vice president in our asset management division, and by Justine Johnson, a vice president in our government and community relations department. I want to give a brief overview today of NYC EDC's oversight of the tour helicopter industry and its management of two city owned heliports and then touch on intro 3470, which would require that EDC produce an annual sightseeing plan for tour helicopters. After my testimony, we'll be glad to answer any questions that you may have. 
Uh, it's important to begin any conversation with an overview of the regulatory structure of the helicopter industry. Um, the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, really has sole authority to control all U.S. non-military airspace and determines the rules and requirements for its use. Um, this means that the FAA has sole authority to determine aircraft manufacturing standards, operations and maintenance, flight paths and altitudes, as well as designating airports and heliports, and finally, the regulation of aircraft noise. Um, aircraft noise is regulated through standards that are promulgated internationally uh, through organizations such as the International uh, Civil Aviation Organization, uh, established by regulation by the FAA and applied when an aircraft acquires its airworthiness certification certificate. Um, the standard requires that aircraft meet or f that uh, aircraft meet designated noise levels. Uh, for helicopters, there were two stages that existed, stage one aircraft and stage two. But in March of 2014, the FAA adopted the new stage three standard. New helicopter models that are certificated after that date must meet this quieter stage three standards. The aircraft that currently operate out of our heliports are almost exclusively stage two helicopters. And uh, stage three hel helicopters are not yet in the fleet as they're going through the certification process with the FAA. Uh, EDC, per agreement with the City of New York, manages the lease for the city-owned JFK and LaGuardia airports and also oversees the operations of the two heliports owned by the city, uh, the downtown Manhattan heliport and the heliport at East 34th Street. The heliport at West 30th Street is actually under the purview of the Hudson River Park Trust, a state entity. We see the three heliports in Manhattan as critical components of our transportation infrastructure. They really operate as a system. Um, East 34th Street is really focused on corporate traffic. The downtown heliport is focused on tourism, and West 30th Street really on both corporate and charter traffic. Um, East 34th Street is open from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on weekdays and is closed on the weekends. Uh, the downtown facility is open for tours from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, no tour, uh, Monday through Saturday, sorry. No tour flights are allowed on Sunday. Uh, corporate and charter flights are allowed downtown from 9 to 5. The downtown heliport is also unique in that it's the only facility then that can accommodate the military helicopters used for presidential visits. Um, I have recently got some updated statistics from the West 30th Street heliport, so uh, I wanted to update my testimony that last year there were about 57,000 total helicopter landings at those three facilities. The downtown heliport at Pier 6, which is the largest facility, accommodated about 33,000 of those operations. Compared to 2015, which is the year before the helicopter reduction plan went into effect, uh, total helicopter traffic has been reduced by about 30%. At the downtown facility, that reduction is almost 50%. So EDC oversees the facilities, but the day-to-day -day management of those facilities is handled by our concessionaries. Um, Atlantic Aviation runs the East 34th Street heliport. Saker Aviation runs the downtown heliport. Um, the agreement we have with Saker Aviation expires in April of 2021. The agreement with Atlantic for East 34th Street actually expires at the end of this year. So we're going to be issuing a request for proposals this spring for a new operator for East 34th Street. These concession agreements define the terms and conditions for how the facilities will be operated. Hours of operation are established, insurance levels set, terms of payment are, are noted. And the terms of the tour helicopter reduction plan have been incorporated into the agreement with Saker Aviation. Also, the terms of the special permit that the council approved last year for East 34th Street will be incorporated into the uh, RFP for a new operator. I'd like to then provide a brief overview of the modifications that have been made to tour flights, and that really takes me back to 2010. Um, in 2010, West 30th Street eliminated tourist flights, and since that time, all the tour flights in the city have operated out of the downtown heliport. The increase in volume caused by that transfer of, of uh, flights to downtown led EDC to convene the operators, the FAA, and local elected officials in revising the tour routes. Uh, we eliminated tours over areas such as Central Park and established just two mandated tour routes. And I'll give a brief description. Both the tour routes leave the downtown heliport. Uh, departing, they go on the Buttermilk Channel between Red Hook and Governor's Island. They circle the Statue of Liberty and then go up the Hudson River. 
Uh, the shorter route, which is called Tour Alpha, turns back about 79th Street near the boat basin, and the longer tour, known as Tour Bravo, uh, continued across Manhattan at 155th Street and provided a view of Yankee Stadium. Uh, both these tour routes were generally above water, and the altitudes range from 900 to 1,500 feet, except when they're landing or taking off. Um, in 2016, as noted by the chair, Mayor de Blasio and the council announced that we were going to reduce the number of tour flights by 50%. We also made some modifications to the routing, including elimination of any portion of the tour flights over land, including Governor's Island, Staten Island, and the route over Yankee Stadium, and per uh, perhaps most importantly, we prohibited Sunday operations. Together, these combined efforts eliminated almost 30,000 annual tour flights. EDC also tracks complaints about uh, helicopter activity through our 311 system. Uh, most of the complaints the city receives are actually not related to tour flights. Instead, they tend to be about helicopters that are hovering or flying over other areas of the city. Um, in 2014, uh, 1,299 complaints were made about helicopters through 311. 162 of those related to tour operations. Contrast that to 2017, 988 helicopter complaints were made and 76 of those related to tours. So there's been a 24% reduction in overall complaints, but that's contrasted against a more than 50% reduction in complaints related to tour helicopters in the first full year after that reduction plan took effect. Um, as the chair noted, on, on Sunday, March 11th, tragically a photography tour flight crashed into the East River. Um, the helicopter involved in that flight flew out of New Jersey heliport and not from an EDC facility. That helicopter was operating doors off with passengers tightly strapped in. Uh, initial reports indicate that one of the passengers' personal items may have hit the emergency engine shutoff, causing the helicopter to go down. Uh, the National Transportation Board continues to investigate that accident and should release its findings several months from now. As a result of that tragedy and in partnership with the council, we proactively reached an agreement with Sacred Aviation to ban all doors off sightseeing tour flights. We think our partnership with you as the city council is important as we work to ensure that any resident or tourist that wants to take a helicopter tour does so in the safest manner and with minimal impact to the residents below. And we un understand that the only way to make strategic adjustments to that tour uh, plan into flight pass and heliport operations is through the collection of accurate data. Our heliport operator, Saker Aviation, sends a report to the council each month that summarizes the number of flights, identifies whether the pilots were taking appropriate routes over water, and summarizes findings from the 311 complaint system. In cases of noncompliance, EDC has the authority to make a further reduction in allowed flights and or impose a fine of $1,000 uh, per infraction. Recently, uh, we've also begun to share a report that details air quality at the downtown facility. And lastly, in our accordance with our agreement, the operator is researching available technologies to further mitigate noise emission, reduce emissions, and promote fuel efficiency. So I spent the majority of that testimony really focused on the, the tour industry and the operations from the downtown heliport. <coughs> Excuse me. I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the work and the issue about Western and Northern Queen residents face from charter helicopters flying generally over Long Island to the Hamptons. The routing of these flights over LaGuardia Airport means that helicopters fly over neighborhoods such as College Point, Whitestone, and Bayside, while these flights move over water as they travel further east along North Shore near Nassau and Suffolk counties. Um, as I stated previously, EDC does not have the ability to regulate the, the path of any charter flight. The FAA actually mandates that the city heliports be open for public use, and our concession agreements reflect this. But we've advocated and will continue to advocate to the FAA that they reevaluate the allowable flight path for these charter flights, and we would welcome participating in any working group that might be convened with the FAA and the council on that issue. Uh, now to pre-considered intro T-2015-3470, which would require that EDC produce an annual helicopter sightseeing plan in consultation with community, industry, and advocates. Um, we feel that the sightseeing plan called for in the legislation is mostly captured in our concession agreement with SACER, and as you know, we recently extended that agreement. Uh, but we'd look forward to discussing with the council in greater detail what additional information could be useful and a reporting timeframe that makes the most sense. 
We look forward to working with the sponsor and with the council to ensure that this legislation accomplishes the goals of reducing the impacts of helicopters on communities and their residents. So I would thank you for your attention and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, David. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Adrian Adams. And we also, we also have had Brad Lander, Margaret Chin, and Carlos Menchaca with us. Uh, your testimony is right on point. I think it, it takes us to the, I guess, the success story that you worked out within the last year or two with Council Members Menchaca and Chin and Helen Rosenthal on the tour operators. It shows the path that we have to take for the charter flights. And I, I think for those who are in, in, uh, listening for the first time, or especially those communities that are suffering with what was heard and say, how does that relate to us? Uh, why don't we just talk real quick, uh, with Jordan and Council Member Powers. The agreement that was we worked on today, I think that's a, a big step. And I think it's timeline important. And I think based on the tragedy that happened on March 11th, I don't want to underestimate the impact of that. So could you just once again explain to us what was actually put in place today? So the agreement that was put in place today uh, bans doors off uh, tour flights from operating from the downtown heliport. And it was developed in consultation with Sacred Aviation. And it's in accord with the FAA uh, uh, prohibition against such flights for tours. So that's a wonderful step, and that was in conjunction with this hearing in our, our office and working that out with you. Um, what would be the next step? So that was with SACER. We have other operators. So can we expand that? Can we take it to the next level? So uh, the agreement with SACER then flows down to the tour helicopter operating companies. So that provision applies to them under the terms of our uh, concession agreement with SACER. So no tour flights are authorized to operate doors off as a result of this agreement. And now, this incident was not a New York-based helicopter. This was a New Jersey-based. Exactly. Is there any hope or any conversation that we can get our friends in New Jersey at the table to mirror what we've done here? Well, we're hoping, obviously, that the FAA uh, develops additional safety protocols as a result of the accident and uh, does a further investigation that leads to uh, safety standards for all operators operating in the region. So the safety protocols that the FAA have in place and the safety protocols that we of all council members are asking to be looked at, is the EDC involved in any way with the FAA in, in creating some of the basic standards of the helicopter aviation industry? So there are, uh, council member, I'd say there's sort of two parts to that answer. The first is that the FAA has certain mandates that come as a result of regulating the tour helicopter industry. Um, tour helicopters are actually regulated under a, what's known as a Part 135 certificate. And all the companies that operate on the downtown heliport have to conform to the safety regulations associated with that operating certificate. And that includes things such as ensuring that uh, the helicopters come with pontoons so that they can land in the water in case of an emergency. It ensures that the helicopter passengers have to carry with them uh, life preservers in the event of a water landing. Um, it includes uh, mandatory pilot safety uh, review of the aircraft. What, what, in addition to those uh, safety requirements- Is this just tours or is all helicopters? That relates to the tours because those, those operators, those are the requirements of that Part 135 requirement. Uh, for example, the, 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 uh, the life preserver requirement, I do not believe, applies to charter operations. Um, but generally, most of the charter operators uh, have those available and also have the pontoons on, the, on their aircraft. And so with those guidelines in place, and with the operators that use our heliports, does the existing operating companies ever file with the EDC that they are in compliance with these standard regulations? So they have to uh, uh, certify to the FAA that they're in compliance with those standards, and the FAA has the ability, if they are found out of compliance, to either uh, to uh, 
either re revoke their operating certificate or suspend their operating certificate. Obviously, the tour operators have a great incentive to ensure that they're in compliance. And I wanted to, if I could follow up on the answer to the, the previous question, uh, SACER and EDC have gone beyond what the FAA requires in terms of uh, safety protocols for passengers that use tour helicopters. Um, so uh, there is a security system in place at the downtown heliport so that all passengers coming into the facility have to be wanded to ensure they're not carrying weapons. There is also a requirement with the tour operators that passengers can only carry small personal items. So you can only carry a camera or a small purse. Um, all other items such as backpacks or larger items have to be checked in lockers at the facility. And uh, SACRE Aviation also requires that all passengers to and from the, the, the tarmac, the landing uh, pad, have to be escorted at all times by uh, SACRE employees. There's also a safety video that all the uh, tour helicopter companies have in place that um, is required to be viewed by all passengers on the tour flight. So we think that the combination of the FAA uh, mandated safety requirements and the tour helicopter uh, company requirements uh, are a good uh, mesh of, of safety op regulations. So those safety regulations that are in place with SACER, is that bound just to SACER, or is it going to be bound for any old future contract as an operator? Uh, again, uh, those regulations that SACER imposes flow through their permit agreements with the tour operators to all those, com those five companies that operate out of downtown. And those are the only companies that are allowed to operate tour flights. But we're confident that we can... can going forward that those combined any future RFPs or RF operators that come out of the downtown heliport? We, we'd be, uh, yes, we want to ensure that those protocols are reflected in any future uh, concession agreements that we execute. With. And, and that's one of the bills that we've been talking about is to make sure that those type of regulations are not modifiable by a, by a, con by a contract or a concession agreement. Those need to be mandated and set and that's one of the bills that will be submitting together as a team here, um, making sure that anybody who, who's seeking to operate a helicopter are bound by a set um, standards by the FAA and by us, and I think that's where a future hearing and or conversations with the FAA uh, and the Port Authority to talk about how we get to that point will be the next step. Mm -hmm. So back to the FAA guidelines that are in place. Is there any requirement that those certificates be filed with the EDC specifically once they're obtained by the FAA? Um, I don't believe there's a requirement that they be filed with the EDC. We could obviously reach out to the FAA um, and ensure that, uh, ask them that we receive copies of those certificates. Well, that, that's the other pending bill that we have coming is, is just to make that also a requirement. A lot of this happened so quickly, the timeline didn't allow us to have those bills in front of us. But these are what I believe, and I think we all believe in this, this committee, are, are some common sense uh, filing of information that even though FAA and the Port Authority may trump us on certain things, filing the certificates that you're in compliance, I think should be a, a, a requirement from every operator. Now what about the, the flip side? What if there is an actual violation issued by the FAA um, do we have any record of existing violations issued to the tour companies that operate in New York City by FAA for them violating any FAA standards? Uh, uh, Chairman, I'm not aware of any, but um, again, we'd be more than happy to work with the operators and the FAA to uh, investigate that issue. Uh, not aware that any were actually created or not aware that any exist in the first place? That any were issued recently. So th this, is, this is the type of information that we want to work together with you. I think this, this is how going forward as, as a city, we're going to create some new abilities that don't really require FAA permission. I think this is if you have, just like if I was a driver, right? people know if I had a violation for something from my driving record, I think the same thing is going to apply with our helicopter, whether it's a, a tour operator or a charter operator if they've received any violation or in any bad standing for any procedure, especially with the new RFP coming now, right, you said spring, for the 34th Street heliport, this is the type of information I think would be critical before we were to hand out any RFP to do business is what is your track record? Do you have a safety plan in place? Are you in compliance with the FAA? Do you have any existing violations and what have you done to rectify those violations. Those are the type of things that I want us to work on 
that at least we know we don't have to go to a table from somebody in the Port Authority or the Northeast Coast of the Port or the FAA to say, hey, do we need your permission on something on this? I think those are where Council Members Menchaca and Chin and Rosenthal started the conversation with the tour operators and now with the direction that we're taking, we're going to be bringing in charter flights because they've kind of had a free pass up until today, and now we're going to have them also at the table. I think so. So, Councilman, we certainly agree that that safety is paramount with the operations of our facilities, and we'd be more than willing to work with you and the FAA to explore uh, areas in which we can uh, uh, ensure that those uh, certifications are up to date. Thank you, and I think these are great steps. That's what this hearing is all about, is to bring forward this conversation that hasn't been had and to get. Now, I always start off by looking at the testimony. So we've been, your testimony mentioned the wonderful concessions that Council Members Machaka, Chin, uh, and Rosenthal worked out on revising the tour routes out of downtown. So what were some of the considerations that were used when the two tour routes were finally decided that are being used and implemented now? So I think the, the key consideration, especially with respect to the modifications that were made two years ago, is um, we had uh, certain elements of the tour that, that ran over land. In particular, the longer tour uh, included a segment that went across 155th Street and provided an overview of Yankee Stadium. Um, the, the, I think the first thing we said, let's make the tour routes be completely over water and therefore uh, the impact to the communities is reduced, uh, particularly those where the overflights were taking place. Um, so the first tour, as I mentioned, goes up the Hudson and turns back at the boat basin. The second tour, as opposed to now, as opposed to previously going to Yankee Stadium, now continues flying up the Hudson to, to Spite and Dival and the Henry Hudson Bridge before turning around. So um, the other thing is that we, uh, the FAA had worked to ensure that that particular operating corridor was available to tour helicopters. And so it's clearly delineated on the FAA's helicopter route map, and uh, pilots are aware that helicopter tour traffic is operating in that vicinity. Um, and there are protocols put in place uh, between the tour operators and the FAA that uh, lay out the operating standards and requirements. For example, um, at a certain point on the, along the longer tour, um, helicopters are asked to request a higher elevation, uh, but you're entering an area in which the LaGuardia Airport Control Tower is controlling the airspace. So the, the tour helicopter operators reach out to the LaGuardia Tower, ask for permission to climb to that, that higher level. Generally, they're granted it, but sometimes they're not. So, so when I said that the, the tours tend to operate between 900 and 1,300 feet, uh, that's the standard, but we also ask them to go to 1500 if LaGuardia gives them permission. So I, I, I thank you for that, David. You just said that in working with the community groups and the council members, we were able to reduce or mitigate flying over land, that we were to reduce the air traffic impact and the noise on our residents in the city, that it was the least impactful route that we could do, that we reduced time and additional regulations out of the hell ports out of 34th Street. Every one of those arguments is exactly what every one of the advocates and the groups that are sitting behind us are saying we need to do for charter flights. Mm -hmm. So since we've done it, we need to now do it across the board for all the rest of the flights. And I think that's the importance of today's hearing. The, the advances that we made for the tour agency are now going to be what we want implemented on the charter industry. And we're, we're not uh, really going to rest until that happens. So exactly the path that you just took, and that's why I wanted you to go over it, is exactly the path that we need to take with the FAA and the Port Authority and the Guardia Tower and the residents of College Point, Whitestone, Bayside, Queens, and Brooklyn, and any place else that they're being affected by someone who decides to jump on a charter flight from the Manhattan to go make it to their homes in the Hamptons. In the meantime, it's killing every one of us. That's what we want to work on. So can we have, uh, I guess, some type of agreement or conversation future as to bringing in the charter flights to the same type of voluntary but now regulations that exist for tour flights? So um, 
again, we, we certainly understand the impact that those, those, tour, those charter flights are having on the communities in, in northern and western Queens. Um, and we'd be more than willing to sit down with, with your office, with the other council members, and with the FAA to talk through options for reducing the impact of those flights and routing issues associated with them. I, I'd be remiss, though, I didn't say that ultimately the, the, we're not the decision maker in that arena. It really will be up to the FAA to ensure that any operating uh, modifications to, to routing uh, accords with overall aviation safety. But, but I think we need to, we, we're more than happy to sit down and have that. Is, is there an opportunity now with the fact thing that there's a new RFP being about to be issued that we can start to include some of this conversation into the future RFP out of 34th Street? Uh, Justine from EDC, Thank I just you. wanted to add on to David's point. I hear you definitely in terms of it being a collaborative effort here. Um, and, you know, I think we are also, we share the same view in terms of making sure that, you know, we can have a system that works for everyone here. Um, and so we just wanted to re just re reinstate our commitment to working with the council, with the community, with the FAA, and a variety of our other partners to make sure that we are truly thinking through a plan, very similar to how you identified with the tour operators that we can get something very similar with charters as well. Yeah, and I see the council member Rosenthal has walked in and, and part of your leadership and guidance got us to the agreements with council members Menchaca and Chin. So now we're trying to emulate that and, and, and extend that. And so I think since those agreements were put in place, um, David, if we, we could, I think I'm gonna let the council members all have very specific questions as to, as to some of the past legislation and a new, and we're going to come back to 311 complaints and we're going to come back to um, talking about the future of these paths. The RFP, though, we have an opportunity here to engage in this, God bless you, into a question of creating new guidelines, with obviously with FAA and with the Port Authority, but we as the owner-operator of the city about to issue an RFP. I think the agreement that you just entered into SACER, the conversations that we're having, and a lot of this can be voluntarily gained. If someone wants to do business with us, and these are the things we're asking for, should be part of the RFP. I just wanted to get your thoughts on the ability to maybe amend or relook at the RFP before it gets issued to include some of these conversations about safety, flight paths, paths, and having a future look at what was just gained with our tour operators and now putting in for our charter flights. Yeah, so uh, Alex Brady, EDC, we would be happy to continue the conversation with the council about appropriate measures to incorporate into the RFP to make sure that we're addressing concerns as we move forward. Thank you, that's, that's wonderful news. I think for questions, Councilmember Lander, I believe you were first to ask some, so we'd like to turn over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Vallone, and thanks to EDC for being here for the hearing, and thanks, of course, to Council Members Menchaca and Chin and Rosenthal for their leadership. Um, I, I really, I mean, I appreciate the collaborative tone and the sense of progress, but I guess I want to call it into question. Um, I, I don't think the hearing we're having is the right place, and I certainly don't believe that extending what we've done around tourist helicopters is exactly the right path. And I guess I'll start, well, all right, we, we do, we uh, wingle our uh, fingers here because we take noise pollution seriously at the New York City Council, uh, and I take it seriously, so let, let me ask you to, um, well, I'll start with this. I, I asked at the hearing that we had last term whether EDC had some sort of misery index, because there's no doubt whatever else these tourist helicopters do that when they take off and land, and of course when they fly over neighborhoods too, but certainly when they take off and land, they really cause misery for people, and that's hard to factor into, like how much, what's the economic value, what are the emissions, what are the noise levels? So I asked the question, and you know, beyond just 311 complaints, which become a not very useful method of reporting if it happens every single day. Um, again, let's do this. Um, and I was told at the time EDC would take it seriously and would go out on the ground and do some research and talk to people and develop some measures for figuring out whether, in fact, misery was being reduced by the path we took. I haven't seen that. So do you do something beyond track 311 complaints just to know how miserable uh, people are made by the, their proximity to tourist helicopters taking off and, and landing, which seems like it should be one factor amongst others in considering whether this tourist industry, tourist helicopter industry is worth it at all. 
Uh, so, Council Member, I think the, the actions we took two years ago were motivated by reducing the impact that tour helicopters have on the residents of New York City. So that's and what that, I'm asking. If we, did uh, we develop a measure to know whether that's true beyond 311 complaints? Well, I, I think the 311 complaints are emblematic of that reduction and that um, we have seen significantly in a, the, the, the reduction in flights has been met by a corresponding decrease in 311 complaints. And so we think that moving the, moving the helicopter routes over water has significantly reduced the impact of the tour helicopters on New York City residents. But you, that sounds like no, you did not develop an index for check, for, for evaluating. I, what my belief is that the people who live near the heliport on the Brooklyn side or the Manhattan side have essentially given up. They know what the plan was. The helicopters continue to take off and land. Calling 311 to complain about something that's part of our policy in an endemic. No, please, folks, come on, come on, come on. Thank you. I'm going to move on and, and just take that as a no, that we, don't, we did not, in fact, try to put something in place. And it's hard to measure what I learned at that hearing is different people can block out, different people hear it more or less, but that we have not taken seriously just how much misery it causes and really weighed that into whether this industry is worth it at all. Let me ask a couple other questions. So could you just tell me, for stage one, two, and three helicopters, what the decibel levels of takeoff and landing are, and what the emissions are. Like, are we moving to electric, uh, electric powered helicopters? And if not, what are they burning? And how much per hour does each of the stage one, stage two, and stage three helicopters consume? So, Council Member, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, so I'm not going to be able to answer all those questions in terms of emissions and, and, uh, and things like that. Who's what the I, expert? What I can tell you is that the stage uh, three helicopters are quieter than the stage one and two helicopters, and the stage three helicopters have a better emissions profile than the stage one and two helicopters. Those, those standards that the FAA established should reduce the decibel level of the largest helicopters by three decibels, which is, which is a significant reduction. They should reduce uh, the, Wait, the I'm sorry, decibel can level. You, can you, you, you can either answer the question about what the decibel levels of the stage one and stage two and stage three helicopters are. Like, you can't get credit for the, reduc the potential reductions without giving me any information on current reality. So, so uh, Again, the, the decibel levels of he specific helicopters vary. Um, there are maximum established levels with respect to stage three helicopters. Um, the FAA has provided a little bit of information about what that level will be. And if I can find the answer here, I believe it was. I don't tell uh, me about the stage three helicopters if you can't tell me about the stage one and stage two ones, which are ones that are currently flying above my constituents. Do you, you don't know. I came prepared to answer the question about stage three. I'd be more than happy to get back to you with information about stage one and stage two. Just so I'm clear, what's flying currently are stage one and stage two helicopters? Uh, we believe that almost all the helicopters serving our heliports are stage two helicopters. Uh, in reviewing the fleet mix associated with the operators at our facilities, uh, I, I don't think that any stage one helicopters are operating in our facilities. All right, well then I would appreciate if you would get back to me on both the uh, the decibel levels and the emissions levels that you believe the stage two helicopters uh, are subjecting our, our city to. Okay, so I, I do have some information here on stage two. It looks like that they were allowed, the heaviest stage two helicopters were allowed uh, a decibel level of 106 on takeoff, 109 on landing, and 104 during flight. Um, and these limits are lower for lighter aircraft. Um, and that the stage three would reduce those by about three decibels, as I mentioned. Sorry, I didn't realize I had that information. Okay, so they would reduce it from by three from 106, so still, you know, m more than a train. Anyway, I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll let my colleagues, there's other colleagues, so I, what I would just say is this. The core question, it seems to me, should have been then and should still be now, is it worth it? to have the tourist helicopter industry in New York City. And it doesn't sound to me like we have evaluated the question in an honest way. Like, we're not measuring the misery it causes people. We're not honestly looking at the impacts of the decibel levels. We're not honestly looking at emissions, like how can we continue to burn fossil fuels when we're on to reduce our fossil fuel consumptions? I'm not aware that people are promoting renewable uh, electric charging tourist helicopters, although you can tell me if, if there are. 
and that that level of misery and emissions against the, the, the ability of a few wealthy tourists to get a view of our city, it's just not worth it. And I join Congress members Nadler and Velasquez and Maloney, and obviously there are issues of what has to be done by the FAA, what has to be done by the city, but while I appreciate the attention to regulation and again respect the work my colleagues did to get significant reductions in tourist helicopters, I just think the evidence is clear. It's not worth it for our city. The modest benefit of the economic activity gained, which I'll grant exists, like I don't want to be cavalier about the jobs or the economic benefit. They exist, but to me, they are far, far smaller than the misery created and the environmental harm and the safety risk, which I'm not going to spend any of my time on. And it just doesn't feel to me like the administration has just taken that question seriously, given the harms against the benefits. Is it worth it? I feel like if you do, you'll come to the same conclusion that most of us have, that the answer is no, and that what we're mostly doing here, um, though productive, is tinkering at the edges. So yeah. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member, for that um, information as well. Um, I just want to also be very mindful that um, banning tour helicopters from operating out of New York City does not necessarily mean that there will not be noise experience from helicopters. Um, as you may know, helicopters can depart from New Jersey or any other tri-state region or municipality, so um, we do not uh, have the authority to uh, have, uh, have, inf have information or enforcement about where those helicopters are hovering and the flight paths that they take. So I just want to make sure that we're okay, clear. Okay, but where, where are they loudest for nearby residents? Am I right that they're loudest for nearby residents when they take off and when they land? And again, if they are hovering over a specific area, depending on the, again, the, the altitude but, that they are going. Come on, I mean, I just you've got I other just... arguments. For my Brooklyn constituents and the Brooklyn constituents and the Manhattan constituents mm -hmm. of other folks up here, right. where the misery is concentrated is where they take off and where they land. That's where they're loudest. That's, of course, where they are all the time. That's where it doesn't matter if you change the flight path or the route. And we do control that. And we're putting this unnecessary thing right in the middle of hundreds of thousands of people. So it's sure you're true. I mean, yes, they might go to Jersey, and we might lose a few jobs and a little economic value and still have some of the headaches associated with it. But for the hundreds of thousands of people that live close to the downtown heliport, we would immensely increase their quality of life and for a set of people for whom they really hear it. And this is why I started with that misery index. I don't think we really understand that. I'll be honest, personally, I'm able to block it out a little more. Like, I don't notice it, but I know from talking to people that there are a lot of people who's, like, whatever, the wiring in our brains is all different, who can't block it out, and whose lives are immiserated by this unnecessary thing, and we could change that, and I just don't feel like we've taken seriously whether we should change that, and, and I, for one, think we should. So, thank you. So, thank you, Council Member Lander, and we have other Council Members. I'd, I'd like you to invite you on working on the negotiations that were worked on by Council Members Menchaca, Rosenthal, and Chin in the past. And, and I really praise their work. I hope that's clear. I've made that clear to each of, of them. I value and praise the work that they have work. done. And reaching those agreements to extend going forward is what the purpose of today's hearing is, and to bring it to light, God bless the concerns. And I think the other thing a council member brought up, the 311 system is not working. The ability for someone, a senior, anyone, to navigate the 311 system, to log in a complaint, to say, this helicopter is making too much noise, it doesn't exist. There are only three breakdown, um, drop down categories when you link on to uh, helicopter noise. It's either flying too low, it's hovering, or it's passing by. And then the other subcategories are whether it's NYPD, news gathering, or other. There's no tracking device like we have with planes flying in and out of LaGuardia and JFK. There's no ability to make a simple, there is loud noise and I can't live in my house because of this helicopter. You can't do it. And that's why these secondary sites have been created by average citizens here in, in the city to log it. And their numbers are astronomical compared to the numbers that are here. We're talking about over 12,000 have been logged since 2018. And your numbers have like 3,200 since 2014. Um, and without any breakdown on whether they're charter, whether they're tour, whether they're even over Queens or Brooklyn or Manhattan, 
We had asked, even at our pre-meeting, whether EDC would be able to revamp the 311 system. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. So, Council Member, we feel that the 311 system is a critical component of assessing the impact of helicopters on residents, and we really want to ensure that that system operates well for all residents of New York City and that all residents of New York City have the opportunity to file complaints. Um, working with your office, I know we've made a minor correction to the, um, the intake information that's established on 311 to make it clear that all helicopter complaints are welcome for the 311 system. So we'd be more than happy to uh, continue to explore uh, things that can improve the quality of that 311 system and the complaint process. I, I will give you a little overview of what happens when a tour complaint comes in. We do ask that people who complain to 311, uh, if they can give us a, a specific location and a time, as, as a very specific time, it really assists uh, our consultant in examining and trying to find a track, a flight track associated with that complaint. So the Port Authority operates a, a system called WebTrack that, that keeps track of all fixed wing and all uh, rotor aircraft. And so our consultant tries to associate that complaint to a specific tour flight track to ensure and uh, verify that that, whether that tour flight was operating in compliance with the rules of the tour helicopter sightseeing plan. So every tour complaint is measured against that standard. Um, but as I mentioned, we'd be more than happy to, ex to explain, uh, to, to work with you and try and Yeah, that's, that's clearly an area that we can expand on because it's being done now, right? We have websites that are out there that are doing a much better job right. than we as the City of New York are doing. So we need to either incorporate that data right. and use that format for our system because if you're going to track exactly. and see which are the bad operators are, which are the good operators who are making these continuous um, low-flying routes when they can make these different changes, the city and a resident needs to be able to say, there's a helicopter 1,000 feet off my backyard in wherever it is, Manhattan, College Point, Whitestone, Bayside. Um, this 311 system doesn't provide that relief. We just did it with the, the boat operators coming out of city field, the noise complaints coming last year. Uh, now you can actually track the boats coming out of city field marina and say, it's that boat right. at 1130 at night that is destroying my quality of life. Guess what? That boat operator has to answer to us now and say, how the heck did you have Mrs. Smith at 3 o'clock in the morning with the tour? They shut the music off yeah. because we were able to track it. Mm -hmm. So they can't hide anymore, and this is this is what we're talking about. Right, and council member, hear you loud and clear on that particular point. Um, also, want to work with you in terms of as we think about the 311 prompt system, and as well as the categories of filing complaints. I'm happy to work with you in terms of looking at what potential solutions that are available. Whether that's looking at other websites, as you mentioned, that may have a better tracking and, and categorizing system of complaints. Seeing how we can work with 311 to make sure that some of those items are um, implemented into the 311 system, and whether that's over the phone, social media, online as well. Thank you. Uh, council Member Koo, I know you came early so you could ask some questions. And if we could do five minutes for the council members, because they still have some council members <coughs> who want to speak. Thank you, Chair Valon. And thank you, uh, EDCs, uh, for uh, coming here to testify. Uh, you know, I, I represent downtown Flushing, you know, uh, which is very noisy. You know, we have LaGuardia Airport and JFK Airport on the five minutes from LaGuardia, maybe 20 minutes JFK. So it's already very noisy, but a lot of airplane taking off and landing. So my question is, like, why do we need to have the quarter tours in New York City? You know? I mean, we have enough noise already. And, and I mean, I can see we need to have the quarters for the like, emergency, uh, for t uh, news, for medical reasons. But we are not Grand Canyon here. We don't need to take a helicopter to, to do a tour in Manhattan. So I think those uh, tours should be in a ban or cut down as much as possible uh, so that the residents can have a quieter like, life. We already have too much noise now. The ambulance, the bus, you know, the, uh, everything else is, is too much noise and it's, it's, it affects our quality of life. Uh, very much. So my, my question is like, how many uh, helicopter flights above Queens? You have, we have uh, like every day of every, uh, especially Lobby Queens, because even I represent uh, downtown Flushing, 
We have a big portion of residential areas, a low V queens, uh, which I'm unfortunately uh, part of it. And people from over there, they always call and complain about the noise, the helicopters, and about the airplane noise. Yeah. So how many uh, air helicopter tours we have in Northeast Queens? So council member, um, as uh, EDC and as the administration, we are very concerned about the impact of these flights. And we think that uh, we've, we're working to achieve the balance between the economic development activity and the, and the, uh, the residents' concerns. And that's why uh, we're, we were pleased to work with the council in terms of reducing the helicopter tour volumes by 50%. Uh, that, that reduction has led to a, a, a total helicopter flight volume in the city that actually is below levels that were in effect 10, year, in effect 10 years ago. So we think, uh, we think we, that action was, was good and reduced the impact. We, I don't know exactly how many flights are running over Queens because we, we track uh, the number of flights that take off and land at our facilities. However, there are no designated tour routes over Queens because the only tour route, only tour flights that are allowed out of our facilities are the two I mentioned that run up the Hudson River. Um, there may be, there are, most of the flights that are probably over Queens are charter flights or some corporate traffic that could be headed up toward New England. So all of those uh, 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 flights of the hel uh, heliport, uh, do you classify uh, whether they're tours or medical or anything else? No. Uh, we keep a classification of whether they're tours or they're non-tours. Um, th that's, the, that's the distinction we have in terms of the, the way they're logged. So how much revenue do you generate from, from those tours? I mean, how much royalty do they give to the city? I'll let Alex answer that yeah. question. Uh, the downtown Manhattan heliport where the tour flights are concentrated generates, uh, you know, it fluctuates over time but between two and three million dollars a year directly to the city from the concession agreement uh, as well as supporting the 250 jobs of the folks that work there. Right. Thank you. Huh? Can you say it one more time? Yeah. Say it closer to the... Uh, sorry, the answer was uh, the, the tour flights question, those are concentrated at the downtown Manhattan heliport. Uh, that generates between two and three million dollars a year that has gone down since the flight reductions were implemented. And, it, and supporting 250 jobs as well. Yeah, that's not, that's not a sufficient amount of money for the people to tolerate, yeah. That's not sufficient enough. I mean, for us to tolerate all this noise. So unless they, you, you had to charge them more, or cut it down tremendously more, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I would echo uh, what David said earlier, that we're trying to strike the balance between the economic impact and the, and the residents' concerns, and uh, again, you know, here to continue that conversation. Thank you. Huh? Yeah, Council Member Koo, it's a very critical point. And when we're balancing the economic impact versus the life, the quality of life we're suffering on. If we're looking at numbers that are gonna create new homeless shelters and create new economic relief and we're gonna do new schools and we're gonna, then you start thinking about, okay, what's the sacrifice? But if we're talking about an impact so great as this versus an economic benefit so little as that, it, it, it makes those arguments very hard. So I, the, uh, Mark, Council Member Levine was here, but the Council Members Menchaca, Rosenthal, and Chin uh, we're going to have the questions asked together since they were the authors of the success of the previous bills. So however you want to handle the questions amongst the three of you. I will go first. Uh, again, buenos dias. Uh, again, thank you for coming today. And uh, I think you're seeing and hearing a vanguard, a real vanguard for change. The system is broken. Everything from 311 to the environmental data that we're capturing uh, that just started, uh, I think some of my colleagues are going to ask about that. The system is broken. And when we think about what's happening in our neighborhoods, we're hearing complaints about noise, air pollution. I myself take the ferry often and get off at Wall Street and suck the fumes from the helicopters every day that I get off. Um, in fact, we're inviting you to have a meeting of discussion there so we can all be at a peak moment <clears throat> to witness and, and have our own testimony of the impacts that it has. 
But what I want to do is really elevate this discussion beyond, beyond just the siloed discussions that we're having in our neighborhoods from Queens to Brooklyn and Red Hook and really look at it through a new lens. And my first question to you is, how, how are you balancing this contract and other contracts of industry for economic development's sake under a sense of principles. What principles, what values are you bringing to the table to help make the decision from EDC? Can you describe that for me? So I, I think I mentioned balance, and I think that balance includes the economic development issues associated with, with both corporate traffic and, and, and charter traffic and, I'll pause and, you there. Tourism, Sorry, and tourism traffic. Let me just help define what values are driving your decision about this and other contracts. Let's stick to this contract to make a decision. So I'm looking for values. So uh, the first value is operating uh, aviation system that is accessible to those uh, who need to use it. That includes corporate and charter traffic. The second is ensuring that we also meet the needs of the tourism industry in New York City. And I think the concern that we have is that that, that, that I'm not looking for concerns yet. I want to, I want to unpackage the values. That's a real, I want to stay here. I'm going to spend okay. some time here. So, because <laughs> we, we need to make some decisions. And if the values are not aligned, we're going to have some problems. And right. we have some solutions that we're discussing today through legislation. So right now, the values that I've heard are tourism industry is important. Um, and, the, and, and, the and the need, associated jobs associated with it, great. Uh, what else? And, and so uh, other values include operating a first class aviation facility and having the resources available to ensure that those facilities are first class, ensuring that those facilities are operated in a safe manner um, so that we protect the safety of all those who use it, and okay. obviously, ensuring that the impacts on New York City residents are minimized to the greatest extent possible. So th th those are some of the values, Council. Okay, that and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, and we're, we're going to spend more time offline to really design that understanding mm -hmm. if we actually have alignment. But those are, have a lot of conflict here, everything you've presented. And I guess what I, the lens that I want to propose today as we move forward in this new city council with this new committee with an incredible leadership of, of Chair Vallone is that we move into what advocates call just transitions. We have to say no to industries where the balance is not necessarily clear when we bring questions about the future of the planet, the future of our neighborhoods and quality of life, and whether or not this is a necessity for the the everyday lives of New Yorkers. EDC is, a, is in service to New York City residents, and you are hearing us speak and lift the voices of our residents, including the workers. And so I, I really want to champion the work that we need to do as a city, economic development, to protect our workers and transition them out of this fossil fuel, noisy, dangerous industry that you're hearing from us now is just not going to be acceptable. And yes, we heard that New Jersey might have helicopters in the air, but this does not preclude us from, and you should be at the table to negotiate a regional conversation so that we can advocate with our congressional members and come up with a plan. And I think EDC needs to be driving that. With the lens, if we are aligned under a just transitions model, where we can move our industries away from where we need to be, instead of protecting the sense of bottom line in a contract of X millions of dollars, it might not be worth it. So this is an important place to hang out and understand as we move forward in the discussion for these bills. The 311 complaints offer me some questions about what we can do with helicopters to identify them right now. As we discuss the future of the industry, can we, can we tell NYPD and their helicopters to have a very particular kind of identifiable color underneath so that we don't have to give too much of a burden for our people who are calling 311 or our local news stations uh, or our tourist industry so they're at least color coded where I saw a red helicopter above me and now I can report a red helicopter that has uh, connection 
so we can make the system better. These are the kind of things in the collaboration I'm speaking about that we haven't yet seen. And we're gonna need EDC to either align with us or, or we align you. And that's, I think, the message that I wanna send today as we continue to work through these issues around legislation, contracts, and the future of this industry, not just here in New York City, but beyond. And council member, I think we're always willing to engage in that conversation. And I have definitely participated in the past with uh, regional forums that involve uh, residents, elected officials, the FA, and, and the operators. So we'd be more than happy to continue. Thank you, Council Member uh, Council Members Chen and Rosenthal. Thank you, Chair. And thank you for holding this um, important hearing. And I just wanted to get it on the record um, that the tourist helicopter industry, the problem, has not gone away. Two years ago, when we worked with EDC and the city, the main reason we agreed to the negotiation was to bring immediate relief to our residents in the city and workers who have been suffering from the noise and the pollution. Wait, we had introduced legislation. We demanded change. But in order to bring immediate relief, we had to sit down with EDC and we worked out some negotiation to decrease the number. Even with that, just imagine, I live right near there, okay? Right near the downtown heliport. And I agree, finally, you know, on Sunday, there is some peace of mind because there's supposed to be no tourist helicopter flight on Sunday. That was one of the major agreements. And it was good for a while. Then all of a sudden, they're able to find some loophole. Charter flight is okay. So if the tourist gets together and do a charter, they could do it on Sunday. We thought there was no helicopter flying on Sunday, but somehow they found a loophole. And we asked for the environmental report, the pollution, right? We finally got that, but there's no detail. All I see in the report is, yeah, we, we're within the guideline of the permitted exposure level. Yes, we're within the guideline. But if you stand near there, the best place to take a view is at the, on Water Street, we have um, the, the, the park mm -hmm. on the upper level. Mm -hmm. I've been there. I took pictures. Imagine 10, 11 helicopter waiting to take off, and they're all their propellers are going. Why did it need to do that? I remember when we were doing the discussion, the negotiation back then, I said, you know, they're waiting to take off, but they're already getting ready, and you could smell the fumes. And it's not just the residents. The people who work close by, our own agency, Department of Transportation, talk to some of your colleagues about the fumes, okay? So, and the report that we give, yes, you know, 50% reduction sounds great, but there are times, imagine just the report that we got last October, Chair, there were 3,226 flights. And they said, oh, but we were permitted to do 3,490, so we actually did less. But just imagine that and do my math, Okay, no flights on fr fr uh, Sunday, so 25 days out of 30 days, right? 129 flights a day. 10 hours they're open. Average, five, one flight every five minutes. Can you imagine going up, going up, coming, and this doesn't count the one coming back, right? I mean, you look at that scenario, and this is what we're facing every single day. Even when in the freezing cold winter, um, it's still over a thousand flights a month. Okay, so they don't take off five minutes, they take off every 15 minutes. But that's happening every single day, okay, excluding Sunday. Sunday only if it's charter or whatever. This is not the kind of life for our res that we want for our residents. Imagine you live down here or in Barry Park City. This is what is happening to them every day, and it's not worth it. 
when you talk about the amount of money the city generates in the tourism industry, that is something, Chair, that we have never got from the industry, the exact number. They're talking about, oh, we generate this amount of jobs, this amount of money for the city tourism industry. Tourists come to New York to watch a Broadway show. Okay, they stay in the hotel. You don't add all that and include that in your helicopter. Not everybody needs to take a helicopter to visit New York City. They come because of the New York City experience by walking. That's how you experience our city. It's not worth it. Okay, so we did the, we try to cut down the number of flights so that we can get some immediate relief for our residents and our workers in the city, but it's not enough. So we got to find a way to really deal with this issue. It's not worth the money. Council Member Chin, I, Thank you. I believe what you're hearing now today is that it doesn't matter which council district it is, it doesn't matter what part of the city, the city is done. The frustration is there. And we really don't care about a tourist uh, day where they can go fly over. They're not coming to New York City, like more Council Member Chin said, to take a helicopter ride. So if the only impact or the benefit that the city is receiving is a small two to three million dollars when every city resident is being impacted by this extreme quality of life infringement that makes people just want to leave, yeah. is, is, is not acceptable. And I think the more that we talk about this, and I believe that the Council Members and, and Council Member Chin, that's why we've been thanking the first steps were what you did two years ago. That's in no way an answer to everything, but you've got to start somewhere, and that was a start. And even with the, the victories that were received through tourists, none of that was done through charter. So there's many ways for our operators to abuse what's in place, and I think what we're seeing is that we have the ability as the greatest city in the world to make regular, if you're going to do business in this city and you're going to use our heliports, then you're going to answer it to the EDC, to the council, and to the people of this city because we can't take it anymore. And that's what's happening. Yeah, thank so, you. Council Member uh, Rosenthal, I know you're there, and I believe I have Council Member Powers, and then we can get to the next panel. Yeah, and I just wanted to issue a clarification in terms of the two to three million dollars that's generated, that's directly to EDC um, for the operations that are taking place out of the downtown and midtown heliport. Um, there is also in terms of the number of tourists that are utilizing, uh, I guess you'd say like the spillover effect into the tourism industry, that is around uh, 30 million dollars per year. So I just wanted to be clear in terms of the economic impact from uh, the tourists. So I'm just gonna start by saying that um, I, I'm not an economist. Yeah. Can, could you just repeat um, those, those the numbers? The number that time? you said was 30 million, and that was a flawed report. Okay. And we went through that. We went through that report every page last time around, and it pains me that you would bring up that number again because it was discredited last time round. Okay. So I'd rather talk about the loss of all the tourists who no longer go to the South so Street Seaport because when they're standing there, mm -hmm. they're watching 10 helicopters taking off and they're inhaling the fumes. Right. And you know, I, I would ask each of you before you come before this council again to spend an hour downtown on a Saturday. You can't breathe, and it's, there's no question in my mind, I do have a public health degree, we are killing people every day. And they may not die today or tomorrow, but the effects on people's um, physical health, um, I'm sure can't be good. And what's so frustrating to me is that where we left it last time round was that you agreed to do a serious analysis of the impact, the two things that you are not addressing today, which are noise pollution and the, the effects of air pollution. Now, the fact that you contracted out to some company to do this analysis gives me no assurance. 
mainly because the results back are that there's no problem. That just doesn't pass the smell test. We asked you to do two things. Work toward having electric helicopters to eliminate the noise and the fumes, and tell us what the real impact of the fumes and the noise is. You've not done either of those things. And I don't understand how you can continue in good faith with your franchise agreement downtown heliport and with the thought of redoing or doing an RFP and a new contract at the 30th Street with such an um, embarrassing record. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't know how we've gotten mad. We've gone through the five stages. We've gotten mad. We got mad again. Some people are crying. We've, you're denying it. Um, what, what can we do to move the ball forward to get these helicopters to um, move to the next stage in technology? I, I love the way Councilmember Menchaca worded it. Just, what, just, just transit. transit. Just transition. You're, you guys are doing great stuff with green jobs. Why are you falling down in this industry? What, what are the hurdles? So, Councilmember, I think that those two concerns are our concerns as well. We, could, we care about the noise impacts. We care about the emissions impacts. Uh, we're, just, we're, um, we're, you're, we don't want to go through the anger again. So that's only, like, please don't do a preamble like that. Please, I'm begging you. You're talking to people who are relatively smart. And, and all we're asking you to do is pay attention to the needs of the residents of New York. And there's no question that you seem to get it in some areas, right? Green jobs, wind, solar. The whole point of an EDC is to use economic tools to move the ball forward for our city. You're falling down on the job. Please don't start the sentence with we're doing everything we can because we've established you haven't. So what I'm asking you is something a little different. What are the hurdles to moving the ball forward to green technology? What's the hurdle? What's getting in our way here? So, so the issue with respect to um, uh, noise and emissions and the certification of helicopters. Again, I mentioned the FAA in terms of its certification protocol. I understand so, the federal government. So we all know that hurdle. We well, cannot. How, what tool in the toolbox does EDC have so, to address these concerns? You. So, I, I'm not talking about the FAA. So EDC and the city advocated that stage three helicopter technology should become the law of the land, it became the law of the land, and EDC advocated that Congress mandate phasing out of stage one and stage two helicopters. So does your, so okay, does your contract be, reflect that? So does your franchise agreement reflect that belief? Our franchise agreement cannot prohibit those helicopters from operating. Does it have a facility. timing toward the model stage three helicopters? Do you have a, a timing that says, okay, we're going to give you two years industry right. to get there, or are we going to do what Trump's doing, which is saying, eh, maybe not? We would welcome phasing out those those uh, types of helicopters. However, we are precluded from doing so by federal law. So we're more than happy to advocate on that behalf. Why and, not and use other financial tools like incentivize them to say that you're, the, you're allowed to lease our space, the cost to you is $100 million today. And as you move toward stage three helicopters, the cost to you will be $2 million. So, you know, that can take as long or little as you want, but the franchise agreement, the RFP, makes a financial incentive, because mm -hmm. you're EDC. How about that? I think we're more than willing to explore options that 
allow us to, in and, to incentivize without, without running into federal preemption issues. So I, I can't begin to discuss it with you today because I just don't know where that boundary is. But again, that's, that's a conversation we're willing to have. And I just, just want to add, um, hear you loud and clear on that particular Thank point. Thank you. Um, and just want to make sure that, you know, we are working together in terms of, to your point, there are incentives that whether we could look at different strategies or solutions, um, happy to work with you on those particular areas. So I hear you loud and clear in terms of what incentives can we, can we make sure that we can look at and, and really consider as we have an opportunity as part of a new RFP to think through some of these items. So I think this is an ongoing conversation, but I think what I'm hearing is very clear that looking at incentives could be one potential um, solution here. And I think there are many more that we can continue to discuss. I think what's so disheartening mm -hmm. is that your willingness in this room to say we're happy to work with you is just hollow. And we know that because of the negotiations that ended before where it specifically said in the agreement, mm -hmm. um, in addition to the reduction in flights, included a requirement to, quote, actively research available technologies to further mitigate helicopter noise, reduce emissions, and promote fuel efficiency, and to implement such technology as it becomes commercially feasible. Now look, the reports we get on a monthly basis, I apologize, Chair. Yeah, no, this is um, important but stuff, so go ahead. The reports we get back and what you showed us at a meeting prior to this hearing don't reflect any of that. Okay. They reflect a silly outside contractor. I'm really nervous how much we're paying these guys. And I'm, because I, whatever that is, we should put that money to taking care of the homeless because they're clearly not capturing what any human being is experiencing mm -hmm. down at the seaport. Yeah. So um, I appreciate your words, but t today they're hollow. Okay, understood. And David, if you could talk a little bit about the emissions monitoring at downtown, I think that would also be helpful as well. Yeah, so we have put in an emissions monitoring protocol downtown. Again, we're more than happy to work to see if we, there are ways we can enhance that protocol so it provides better information to you as, as decision makers. Well, so. I, you tell me. Don't come to me with your problems. All I know is that you gave me a report that said there's no problem with emissions. You know, I'm sure you figured that out after a month or two, noticing that it didn't have any value. Um, so what did you do about it? Or are you waiting until I need to say something? So we. Uh, Upon getting those initial readings, which, which showed very low levels of uh, criteria pollutants associated with jet fuel, um, we reached back out to our environmental consultant and asked for the reasons. And they are largely weather-related and volume-related, that in the winter months, the... the I, 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 please. I mean, if you want to say it on the record, you're on oath, and you're, you know... I, I want this administration to shine, but continue with your no, in, answer. In the winter months, the likelihood of exceeding those OSHA EPA standards are much less than they are in the summer months because of the, the conditions of air and the heat associated and how it affects the emissions and the volume of helicopter oh, flights. So we think I was, I, I was concerned about the readings and reached out to try and understand why they were low. But as I mentioned, we're more than happy to have a conversation about how we can enhance that protocol. So again, I'm not paid to do this work. You are. But that answer doesn't pass the smell test. Have you gone there and looked at where they put the it's on, uh, monitors? It's on, it's on the roof of the heliport. So do you, have you looked to see exactly where? Yes, it's on the roof of the heliport. So I on the roof of the heliport. Where? That means how it's, many? Is it the right it, number? There's one monitor, and it is, we just, we determine. Sounds like it's a weak monitor. Is it up to code? Is it up to the standards of what monitors should be? How much are you paying in the contractor to do this work? I, I don't have that number with me, so. Is it 100,000? Is it 500,000? I'm sorry, I don't know how, what the contract is. This is really disappointing. So, Chair, again, I want to thank you for holding this hearing. 
Uh, I want to warn you uh, <laughs> because I know you're looking at uh, what to do with the charter flights over your district. Uh, buyer beware. Uh, you know, this is a group, uh, this is an agency that promised me pretty much in the first year of my job that they would be p requiring painting the underbellies of the helicopters so they would know whether it's tour, charter, or whatever. That has not been done. What we get from them in terms of reports are inadequate and not satisfactory. So um, I, I just want to share with you, I just want to calm down and take a deep <laughs> breath. Uh, it's just it really, down. really disappointing. And I, on behalf of New York City residents and in my oversight capacity, I want to let you know how deeply, deeply disappointed that we are. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Council Member Rosenthal, now you know why I fought so hard to be the chair of EDC. The Northeast Queens and the rest of the city that has not had any conversation is now having a conversation that has never had been had before. And to bring that passion that you have with Council Members Menchaca and Chin for what happened in Manhattan needs to be applied on all five boroughs so that everyone has a seat at this table to talk about this onslaught of helicopters and that there's, it's providing no benefit to anyone sitting at this table or at this city. So even to just call for a complete new look at helicopter safety protocols and standards, which is what we're doing, that's what this hearing is about. It's a complete, it hasn't worked, what can we do? What can EDC do in their capacity as the owner operator? What can we as a, do as a council to bring in accountability for the community impact that we are suffering. That's what this is about. And to bring Northeast Queens and our Queens residents to this table that has not been heard before is why I'm here today. Because we were too long forgotten. And I, I thank the, re the advocates that made their way out throughout the rest of the city. We will get to you, part of this testimony, and, and I know EDC is gonna stop and listen. Um, we also have Council Member Powers, and we've been joined by uh, Council Member Cornegy. Thank you, and I can't follow Councilmember Rosenthal so passionately, uh, partially because I'm under the weather, but thank you for being here and for your testimony. I'm sorry I missed uh, the beginning of it. I actually represent the 34th Street heliport, um, which I think has some different usages uh, than uses than the other ones. But I guess it's a, the first question I had was we were talking about, I think that Councilmember Land and others really talked about how to balance between the economic impact and the economic value of any item. I mean, this is what we do all the time as council members have to make these decisions about economic impact and value relative to the community and the community's concerns. And that's, I think, the balance. And I've not been here for, for much long, for very long, so I don't have the frustration that others do. Um, and I will mention that I think 34th Street has less issues than the other ones. I, I don't actually get many complaints about it, but um, but I may, but I, one day I may. The my question is on that economic impact that we talk about, whether it's around tourism, corporate charters. I, I heard something that Councilmember Rosenthal brought up, but this is the Economic Development Committee, so I should ask, what is the economic value or development value of the of of those three different charters? Uh, uh, tourists and uh, and uh, and uh, what's the third one? Third charter tourists and uh, and the cor the corporate. For those three, I think the thirty million dollar number was was named earlier. But do you guys have a study? I mean, we talk about that, but what is the? How do we present the value of so, the industry? So, council member, we have not done a recent study of the economic value of the heliport system. Um, the studies that were done back in 2011 and 2012 really did focus on the tour helicopter industry. Uh, one was done internally at EDC and one was done by the uh, Rudin Center. Um, and that's where that $30 million comes, figure comes from. It includes, obviously, some, some tourist-associated spending. It, the bulk of it, though, is the direct expenditures of the tour helicopter operating companies themselves in terms of fuel, maintenance, uh, employee salaries, stuff like that. That being said, uh, we don't have a, an, a, a study that I'm aware of that looks at the impact and the uh, value of the corporate and the charter traffic. Um, I think the, the council in its approval of the East 34th Street special permit last year recognized the value of the heliports to the corporate community in New York City and that these facilities are relied upon by those corporations uh, for uh, transportation. 
and that there is a there is obviously a value associated with that, but I really can't tell you what that. So, that so is, I, I would certainly recommend. I mean, as we debate, and we're hearing a lot of passion about whether to change or do something, and we have certainly have legislation before us, and we will be debating more legislation, I'm sure, in the future. It would be helpful, I think, for the EDC to have an economic study, A, to talk about the value that it provides. And what I mean by that is we can then evaluate that exact conversation that I think folks are, are asking, which is how do we find the balance? You have folks from Queens and other and downtown and other places that feel like it's, it's, it's too much. And, and I think the argument in favor is around, or, or in some preservation of, is around the value, but I don't think we have anything today that actually provides us. And I think that to come to a hearing and to, to, to tout the economic value of something, it would be, it would seem to me to be you know, not the wise or, or something else to actually bring numbers to us about that economic impact. Um, the second question, what, what does EDC, I think Councilor Rosenthal asked this question, but what is, F, the FAA has control over the routes, it sounds like, and some federal preemption on helicopter standards, but EDC has control over the site, the two of the three facilities, and so I have two questions. One is, if we made changes to the two, 34th Street in my district and downtown, does that, at the city level, does that leave 30th Street absent whatever changes we make? And, and second, um, what, what is within your control? Obviously the RFP process is within your control, determining what types of, of flights are fly out of any single facility. What, what else is directly under EDC? Uh, so, Council Member, the West 30th Street heliport is under the purview of the Hudson River Park Trust right. and is uh, run uh, similarly under an agreement between the Hudson River Park Trust and Air Pegasus, who runs that facility on their behalf. Um, uh, obviously, standards that we would apply to our facilities would not necessarily apply to HRPT and their oversight of that facility, but uh, uh, they could be part of a conversation. Um, with respect to what is within our purview, um, these facilities operate as public use heliports available to anybody who's flying a helicopter um, subject to, to protocols in terms of, of uh, notifying about landing and takeoff. Um, so we have limited authority in terms of restricting the types of helicopters that use that facility. What we can do, is, as you know, is we've established operating hours for both, of, both the heliports that seek to limit activity at night. Um, and at East 34th Street on the weekends. So um, again, that's part of that balancing. So we have authority there. We don't, don't have authority to, as I mentioned, to restrict the types of helicopters. Are there gonna be changes in the RFP coming up that would impact any of the concerns that folks are bringing up here, whether it's related to, I, I know you can't talk about an RFP, you know, publicly, but I mean, what, are, what, it, what changes sh should anybody anticipate in terms of concerns or comments that have been raised? To date. So one of the, uh, what we have incorporated so far into the drafts of the RFP are the standards that the council uh, asked for as part of the special permit for East 34th Street. So for example, uh, the L operator will be required to report on uh, the number of operations uh, monthly and uh, the number of and then we will also report on the number of complaints that are filed from uh, your community board district in terms of East 34th Street. Um, there are other protocols in the RFP associated with uh, the safety of operation, the financial terms, and all that stuff that are standard in, in both our, our agreements. And, and I'm just wanna, I don't want to use, I know I use my time up, but um, just how many flights are out of 34th Street per day? I don't have it per day, but for last year, um, I just got the updated numbers uh, from the operator. There were 9,200 flights yearly out yeah. of 34th Street, obviously Monday through Friday since it's closed on the weekend. Right, right, right. And on stage three, on uh, the transition to stage three helicopters, I think you said stage two is what everybody's using right now. Sounds like stage three is something that uh, is being requested in terms of different standards. Has the, what, it, what, would, what would be the timeline in terms of actually moving to stage three? And what, what, is, what does the EDC feel like is the timeline? What does the industry feel like is the timeline to get there? I mean, I think colleagues here, it's today. Right. So what is the actual? I, I, I wish real. I could answer that question, Council Member Powers, because it really is up to the industry in terms of developing helicopters that are certificated under that standard. 
we're obviously would hope it would be sooner rather than later. We think, as I mentioned in, in the previous uh, remarks to, to Councilman Rosenthal, we think it would be very helpful if Congress would mandate a phase out of stage one and stage two and require operators to, to move their fleets. A similar phase out was required for fixed wing aircraft uh, by Congress uh, many years ago so that stage one and stage two fixed wing aircraft had a, dead, uh, a sunset date by which they could not be in the air or their engines had to be retrofit to meet the new uh, noise and emissions regulations associated with stage three fixed wing aircraft. We think something like that would be a, a great thing for uh, instituting at our heliports. But again, we can't take that action unilaterally. You, you can't do, you think EDC has no power to regulate? No, because- Or incentivize? A, because as a public use facility, we, um, we are open to those aircraft that are allowed to fly in the sky, and that includes all three stages. Gotcha, and I'll finish with this. Would, would you be willing to, I might ask you to commit under oath anything, but I, I think it would be helpful for me if you would be willing to work, and obviously the, the, with the districts that are impacted, the industry and others, to come up with some snapshot around economic development of the, of the different industries, the ones that are impacted that are flying out of 34th Street, the tourism industry, so we can find out what that balance looks like. And I support, certainly support my colleagues representing their neighbor, their communities around noise and, and noise issues. I, I think that Councilman Lander was, I think, pretty responsible in his, in his comments about how do you strike a balance. And I think to be here and not have the actual economic numbers around what is being provided doesn't actually let us argue the argue the value and in fact um, uh, leaves us uh, to, to, to believe that we don't have that numbers or we're not willing to share it and, and certainly as you talk to Councilmember Vallone, Councilmember Chin, Councilmember Rosenthal, they're, I think they're doing a, a good job representing their constituents who feel under distress and so um, we have to find uh, uh, a pathway here, but I certainly would, would welcome seeing the actual numbers that you guys are, are talking about in terms of the value. Thank you, I'll, Councilman I'll be Powers. glad to take that request back to our leadership. <laughs> Thank you. Councilman. So before we let the EDC panel go, I mean, part of today's hearing, talking about frustration, was the comment and our call to extend the North Shore helicopter route. So just for those who aren't even aware, could you imagine the level of frustration we in the city have when a regulation is passed in 2008 that says, yep, there's charter flights coming out of Manhattan and they're going out to Hampton. So what we're gonna do is mandate those charter flights to fly over the water, but only in Nassau County and East. So guess what? They could fly straight over Queens, right over our houses, right over George Mertz's house where he's got a landing of apocalypse now every three minutes in his backyard. All he needs is the music coming out of the speakers. And it was never even considered for Queens. So our resolution is calling on the extension of the North Shore helicopter route to say, get over the water, stop flying over the land. So that's what our call is today on that resolution is to ask for our uh, in Albany and Congress to make sure that that's addressed. Do, does EDC have a point in support or a comment on the extension of the route? Uh, so, Council Member, I think I mentioned earlier, we'd be more than happy to participate in discussions about that because we realize that the residents in your district are adversely affected by the mandate routing on the North Shore route. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. All right. But again, we're happy to, happy to work with you on that particular resolution. All right. And I'll thank the EDC for almost two hours of testimony. Um, there's a lot to work to be done. Clearly, the safety of the city is on the line here with a complete overlook of the helicopter industry today is a step in that direction, uh, and I thank you for your conversation. So our first panel will be from Congressmember Thomas Swazi's office, whose district comes right through into Northeast Queens, Justin Connor, uh, Sam Goldfin from the Helicopter Tourism Council, George Mertz from We Love Whitestone, and Warren Schreiber uh, from the New York Community Aviation Roundtable, amongst many of his tables, and Councilmember Barron, has joined us. Thank you very much, Councilmember Barron. Uh, that will be our first panel. I'd ask everyone to keep their comments to within three minutes because there's a few panels that are going to speak. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, Councilmember Machaca is going to take over for me for this panel for two minutes. I'll be right back. Okay, let me, may I begin? Awesome, and make sure the, the red light is on. Okay, got it, thank you. I hear you um, loud and clear, thank, thank you. you. Hi, um, first of all, my, um, I wanna thank you, Councilmember Machado, because you hit it right on the, the nail on the head earlier, collaboration and partnership. In our experience, we've met with the FAA and others on this whole issue, and we get a lot of talk but we get no partnership, no collaboration. So having said that, I'll go read my statement. Um, my name is George Matsopoulos. I'm the uh, Vice President of We Love Whitestone Civic Association in Queens, and I'm a resident of Whitestone for 32 years. And um, I'm just gonna jump to the, the issue here is the seaplanes and the helicopters. For us, it's the helicopters. Um, one of the things that was said earlier is misery level. When you have 25 to 30 helicopters flying over your house, in an hour, that's misery. When you're mowing your lawn and the sound of your lawn mower is drowned out by the helicopter flying over your head, that's what you're experiencing in Whitestone. Um, in our community, we, we sort of dread the upcoming Memorial Day weekend because once Memorial Day hits, the commuter helicopters, it's, it's an onslaught to our senses. They just fly over constantly. Um, it's become really intolerable for us to deal with this. And it goes on from Memorial Day to Labor Day. I mean, it really goes on all year now, but that is the peak time that we, you can't go outside, you can't sit in your backyard, you can't enjoy yourself. The kids can't play outside because, you know, there's so much noise. They can't go in their pools. It's just crazy. Um, so what, we're, what we think is, you know, um, the people that are taking these flights are the people that are going to the Hamptons for vacation. They're having a good time, we're miserable, okay? And it's gotta, something's gotta come to a head. Uh, we've been meeting with the FAA, with other people, with our congressmen, with our old congressmen, with our new congressmen, the mayor, um, everybody you can think of, and we're still here. I was here three and a half years ago, and we're still at the same point, nothing. And so with the last minute, is there any recommendations you want to give us? Any, any specific ideas, recommendations that you want us to hear? Well, um, I think the, the issue of reporting with 311, the 311 system is very flawed, okay? We have an app that we use that one of our residents developed. And when you talk about getting information, the helicopter pops up on the map. It tells you what the altitude is. It tells you what the speed is. You get the tail number. If it's an NYPD helicopter, it knows it's an NYPD helicopter. Um, the information that you know they're getting from 311 is just not it's, it's not accurate at all. Uh, the number I wanted to tell you real quick. I know I'm limited here. I'm sorry, but um, where's my numbers here? Okay, so this application that we have in 2017, um, we had over 79,000 complaints logged in. Okay, now that includes Long Island. In the Queens area. Are you talking about your app? The yes. App? Okay. In the Queens area alone, in Whitestone, um, there were over 10,000 complaints, 12, 10 to 12,000 complaints logged in from residents about the helicopters flying over. Significantly different than what the 311 is saying about 900. Um, so that's something else, you know, um, that has to be looked at. You, thank, so thank you for your testimony, and I know we have a written copy. Everything is there, so. so thank you for that and we'll follow up with you probably to kind of capture that data so that we can compare Absolutely. at a committee um, level. Whatever is needed, I'm here. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, good morning, uh, Council Member uh, Menchaca. I'm going to um, do a little bit from the written testimony. My name is Warren Schreiber. I'm currently the co-chair of the uh, New York Community Aviation Roundtable, also known as NICAR. We represent over four million residents of uh, Brooklyn, Queens, uh, Manhattan, the Bronx, and Nassau County, and we were created under a directive from uh, uh, Governor Cuomo. Um, the, um, um, today you heard a lot of testimony about details, uh, details about the aircraft, um, and it doesn't have to be that difficult. It's about noise. It's about noise, and we all know noise when we hear it. And that's what's happening with the helicopters. 
the noise that comes from the helicopters are greater than the noise that comes from aircraft for a couple of reasons. Helicopters fly at a lower altitude. They fly at a lower speed so that the noise stays in that one particular area for a longer period uh, of time. And these charters that are going out east to the Hamptons, they offer no benefit whatsoever to the city of New York. This is solely for recreational purposes. The passengers on these flights, they pay anywhere from $650 to $1,500 per seat to be, uh, to be on, these, um, on these flights. The, um, uh, there was a, a report from the uh, United uh, Kingdom uh, Civil Aviation Authority which has shown aircraft noise to be a major stressor impacting cardiovascular disease, children's learning abilities, sleep disturbance, nocturnal patterns, psychological matters, pre pregnancy, and obesity. These helicopters, they go over residences, schools, libraries, hospitals, nursing homes, places of worship, and recreational areas, and all of those places are negatively impacted. Our solution is to have the FAA um, mandate that these helicopters fly a water route. They don't have to fly under land. They overland. They could fly a water route. Also, EDC has to accept some responsibility in this, and uh, one of the solutions would be that if there are really bad players in the industry, maybe their, um, uh, their ability to uh, depart and arrive at the heliport should be suspended they should no longer be allowed to operate. And I just want to, just one, one last thing that um, I, I heard uh, mention of um, uh, a DB level of 100. And um, the FAA, which is somewhat behind the times and not in lockstep with other countries, they consider uh, a threshold of 65 DNL. So 100 DB, DB, that's, that's totally off the charts. I can't even imagine people being impacted to that level of noise. Thank you. Thank you. Really quick question before I hand it back to the chair. Uh, is there an EDC representative in the, in the room? Can you raise your hand? <laughs> okay. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Maybe we make a great team. Yeah. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin Connor. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Warren. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Justin Connor. I'm field representative for Congressman Tom Swazi, who represents the third congressional district, uh, Thank you Northeast for being here. Queens. What? Thank you for being here. Oh, absolutely no problem. Um, portions of Nassau County and Suffolk County, and as per Warren Schreiber right here, I am also on the LaGuardia Roundtable as a member and the JFK Roundtable as a member. Um, we go quarterly meetings regarding the different airports, but one of the biggest issues that our office has been dealing with is the constant helicopter assault on Whitestone Bay Terrace Bayside. Um, it seems to be nonstop. Uh, there's a gentleman that's in the back left here. His name's Albert Marashi, George Metropolis. His wife, uh, Carmen's over here. There's a gentleman by the name of Harry Zavardis, who's not here today. However, he was in the hospital four weeks ago, five weeks ago with chest pains, potential stroke, potential heart, high blood pressure, stomach issues, um, mainly because of post-traumatic stress disorder due to the amount of helicopters that are flying over his house. At all hours, 500, 600, 700, 800 feet, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning, I have visited his house. I have been to Whitestone, and I have seen the helicopters go over the, this area. The congressman, we just submitted for the omnibus wording, and the exact wording I did not bring with me, but I can, I can let everybody know, is that the helicopter should be flying minimum 2,500 feet. Actually, excuse me, maximum 2,500 feet, but also over the water. There's no real reason for these helicopters to be taking a shortcut over the residences of Whitestone and Bay Terrace and Bayside. Um, the, the, Congressman submitted a letter, which I'm going to read, and also I did not get to hand it out, but I'll, be, I'll give, be happy to give everybody a copy of this letter. This is a letter that the Congressman, we still have not gotten a response to this letter. This letter is dated March 7th, 2018. And if you could read that for the record. 
Excuse me? If you could read that for the record. Thanks. That's what I'm going to do. Um, this is from Congressman Thomas Swazi. This is addressed to the Honorable Daniel K. Elwell, Acting Administrator, Federal Aviation Administration, 800 Independence Avenue, Southwest Washington, D.C., 20591-001. Dear Acting Administrator Elwell, I represent thousands of constituents in Northeast Queens who are bombarded by helicopter noise on a daily basis. Helicopter traffic is going to get worse as the weather warms up and affluent vacationers get away to the east end of Long Island. We need your help. Please amend the North Shore helicopter route to extend further west to cover Northeast Queens, spe specifically to encompass the residential neighborhoods of Whitestone and Bay Terrace. Helicopter noise is not merely an annoyance. Noise pollution is an environmental hazard that ne negatively impacts the health and well-being of Queens and Long Island residents. I became co-chair of the Congressional Quiet Skies Caucus because my constituents in Northeast Queens are forced to bear with constant and intrusive noise due to low-flying helicopters at all hours of night. Noise pollution deteriorates quality of life as well as property values, and New York elected officials have a responsibility to work with the Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, to develop long-term strategies to alleviate unreasonable helicopter noise. The FAA established the North Shore Helicopter Route in 2008, first as a voluntary path pilots could take over North Shore of Long Island. Then in 2012, it mandated helicopter pilots utilize the route when flying to and from Long Island. In, two, in July 2016, the FAA ruled the route to keep the route active through August of 2020, an unacceptable byproduct of the current helicopters pilots fly directly over Northeast Queens and shift to flying over Long Island Sound once they reach the residential areas in Long Island. The current arrangement complies with North Shore helicopter roads, but forces Queens residents to suffer constant disruptive helicopter noise. The FAA and New York elected officials must come together and build upon the existing agreement. I propose the FAA amend the current rule that requires helicopter pilots to use the, North Shore, the New York North Shore helicopter route to include Whitestone, Malibu Garden, and Bay Terrace in the designated area shielded from excessive helicopter traffic. City Council Member Paul Vallone introduced a resolution on February 14, 2018 to the New York City Council to call on the FAA to adjust the North Shore helicopter route to extend to cover Northeast Queens. I'm in full support of Council Member Vallone's resolution and I call upon the FAA to seriously review our proposals. I look forward to your response and thank you in advance for working with us to achieve this important goal. Sincerely, Thomas R. Swazi, U.S. Congressman, 3rd District of New York. Thank you. Thank you, council members, for holding this. My name is Sam Goldstein. I work with the Helicopter Tourism and Jobs Council. Um, we represent the employees and the customers who fly the tours out of downtown Manhattan. Um, I came specifically today to speak on uh, the oversight of modifying helicopter routes as well as uh, the pre-considered introduction regarding setting up an annual helicopter plan. Uh, air tour operators in New York City are very familiar with annual plans as our tours are the only helicopters operating under a structured set of regulations that ensure community concerns are alleviated while providing customers with an unforgettable viewing experience. These regulations include one designated heliport to conduct air tours from, set hours and days of operation including no, no tour flights on Sunday, an established route that keeps tour flights over water and does not permit flights from crossing over any area of land, monthly caps on flights allowed to operate out of the downtown Manhattan heliport, and monitoring of air quality. Measures in place ensure flights do not deviate from the above restrictions. They also limit noise, which is supported by the fact that air tours constitute a very small percentage of total noise complaints to the city-related helicopters. Other helicopters, news, gathering, charter, emergency services, have none of the same restrictions and are most often the source of residential complaints. Contrary to some public statements by proponents of today's and other legislation, operators do not fly off route or operate at greater volumes than permitted. The consequences of even one flight in violation of these rules are strict and effective in guaranteeing operator compliance. As the T Helicopter Tourism and Job Council has been with our partners at the city and EDC, we're happy to be a partner in any working group with community members and elected officials to alleviate concerns that still exist. Well, Sam, it's almost like you, you should be 
in a separate hearing because everyone from the helicopter industry should be here to have answer the same questions from every resident and every council member and every person that's lodged a complaint. You have your agreement in place. We're not happy with the terms of the agreement. We're looking not for voluntary concessions. We're looking for mandatory changes to helicopter safety and procedures in the city. And whether that's done voluntarily or not, we're going to achieve that. Uh, we're looking at everything. And the groups that are here, the residents that are here, the council members that are here, it's not working. It's not working. And it's not benefiting this city. So all of this is going to be looked at. Congress Member Swazi uh, can't tell you how important it is to have our congressional support from every one of the Congress members that are now on board with this. In fact, there isn't anybody who's actually on board with what we're asking for. There is yet to be someone to come up to me and say, you know what, that's not a good idea. There really hasn't been anyone that's come up to say changes can't be made. Uh, George Mertz, and to Dan, and everyone at We Love Whitestone. Uh, if you didn't volunteer, I got my own beep, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the freaking chair around here? <laughs> uh, but if, if you weren't voluntarily doing that, we wouldn't have any of the data, right? If, if we didn't have that website that so clearly showed to everyone for the first time, and then you go to EDC and say, can't we do that? And then they go, uh, we have a 311 system. <laughs> it doesn't work. And Warren, you, you hold so many titles, we thank you. Now, just before the panel goes, what has the aviation roundtables dealt with regarding this issue? Has it come up? Have we had conversations with FAA and the Port Authority about helicopter safety? Sure, it's, um, uh, Council Member, it's been, it's been an important issue for us at our um, uh, last meeting of the uh, LaGuardia Committee, I believe it was back in October, we actually had um, representatives of the Eastern Regional Helicopter um, Council um, at the uh, meeting and they made a presentation about their um, Friendly Skies um, initiative, yeah, which we didn't feel was very friendly, but, uh, but, but, but at least we were able to open a dialogue with them and I know George has, uh, has met with them, he's gone to some of his, um, uh, to some of his meetings. As far as I know, um, the FAA has not um, taken an active role um, in this issue. There is now a new um, a regional director, uh, Director uh, Solomon, uh, and um, uh, I, I think that um, she's looking to um, back away from what was uh, at one time an adversarial relationship with the community, and I, I, I think she would be open to working with people. Now, I'm getting that sense also that there's, there's, there's these conversations are happening because there's more of a ability to take these common sense asks and it's almost be impossible to fight them because we're asking some of the things were done two years ago could clearly immediately go into effect in the charters flights and now the reason why the timing of this hearing was so perfect is you have an RFP about to be extended to the 34th Street heliport. Now is exactly the time that we need every advocate and every person in the city to say, hey, don't issue another contract to anyone until we talk about this and make sure it's embodied in the contract. Otherwise, we lose three, four, five more years. And then we're going to wait. It's going to be a whole other council, and it's a whole other. Sometimes the, the arguments again, they just wait us out. You know, and it's, sometimes that works that the airports wait us out. We get annoyed, we get pissed off, and then life goes on. Just like, unfortunately, with our school tragedies, that's what the NRA has done. They just wait us out, and nothing's been done, and that's just unacceptable. So we have other panels. Let's get to thank you, everyone else, for making up this. One, one hey, last from the Just one, one last comment. I have spoken with the FAA within the past two weeks, and Robert Cortell the president of the Eastern Helicopter Regional Committee, and they have promised to George, and they, they, they promised in front of 60 people, whatever, <laughs> that they will be having a meeting with We Love Whitestone, the FAA, and the Eastern Helicopter Regional Committee sometime in May at the FAA headquarters in Jamaica. Well, you may want to inform them if they don't have the meeting with EDC in this committee, it's really not gonna have any weight. So we have to make sure that all the parties, because we don't want to reinvent the wheel over and over again, are sitting okay. at the same time so we can get this done. No problem. Thank you, everyone. So the next panel, uh, we'll have four, four members, and we'll keep it going the same way. It will be John Teleporter from Stop the Chop, Jeffrey Moskin from Riverside Park Conservancy, I think, Mike Gannon from Douglas Manor Association, welcome, Mike, and Joseph Swartz from the residents of Lower Manhattan. Joe, you're gonna need more people if you're representing all the residents of Lower Manhattan. 
And then we have, for those who are left, just so you know, in the, in the audience, I'm gonna, we have six people left. Those six, I'll do real quick. Uh, Ms. Campbell, Ms. Timmel, uh, Ms. Tuma, uh, Mr. Granick, uh, Michael Rychek, and Stacy Shubb. You're gonna be on the last panel, so hang around for that. Okay, if you wanna start from maybe left to right, you're right. Thank you, thank you, City Council Member Vallone. My name is John Delaportis. I'm with Stop the Chop NYNJ. Uh, we're a community group. We have about 2,000 members. Uh, we represent uh, a lot of different folks who are very negatively affected. Um, we represent, um, we have veterans in our, back from Afghanistan who say it's worse than Afghanistan and triggers their PTSD to always have these helicopters. Uh, we represent elderly people who've told me that it sets off their hearing aids when these helicopters passes and sets a, a tinning noise. We have new, new mothers who say their babies can't sleep because of these helicopters. We have people trying to work from home and earn a living who say that they can't work from home because of these helicopters. Uh, we have people whose pets go crazy because of these helicopters. We have everything under the sun. It, it's, it's really just the amount of human misery is, is, is incredible, and so we thank you for taking the time. I think. Uh, we're very thankful that you've taken the time to do this. Uh, if I had one critique, it's only that the EDC, in, in our view, is just hopelessly corrupt, and they're never going to do anything about this. And the fellow from the EDC, almost everything he said was a lie. Um, so I only have three minutes, but I'll go through as many of his lies as I can in the three minutes. Um, uh, let's see. He says FAA is the decision maker. Lie, 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 lie. The city. I think we established and, that today. Yeah. yeah. The city. It's the city's contract with the helicopter operator says that the mayor, at any time, without cause, can terminate the contract if the mayor determines it's in the best interest of the city to do so. So, at any time, the city council can pass a resolution directing the mayor to terminate that agreement, and we're done. We don't have to deal with the EDC. We don't have to deal with the FAA. We don't have to have any more studies. We can just be done with this, and that's uh, the answer. Um, as far as uh, the, 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 he said, well, you know, there's gonna, still going to be helicopters. The EDC's own studies show that 97% of the helicopters over the city are their tourist flights. So yes, there will still be 3% of the helicopter traffic that there was before. Uh, they, they left that out. Um, they said they work with community groups. We're the biggest community group. We've been around for five years. We have 2,000 members. We've, we've, we've begged them for a meeting. They've never met with us. They've never even responded to our multiple requests for a meeting. What community groups is he working with? I'd like to know. Um, 311, I think it's obvious. Uh, there are 200 helicopters who pass by my window every day. Am, uh, am I supposed to report 200 times a day to 311? And when you do report it, they say, what's the number on the helicopter? And I reported it a couple times, and they say, oh, the helicopter was doing what it's supposed to be doing. So, so the problem isn't, the problem isn't the, 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 the problem is the plan. The problem isn't violations from the plan. The problem is the plan itself. The plan is horrible. The plan was drafted by the industry with no community input, and it's horrible. And we do thank the city council members who got it cut in half. Uh, God bless them. They did a great job. Um, but it's, it's not nearly enough. Thank you very much. Well, just so you know, you probably have about 200,000 more people from my district that will happily join Stop the Chop. So <laughs> you'll have more than 2,000 members after today. Uh, thank you. My name is Jeffrey Moskin. I'm a trustee of the Riverside Park Conservancy. Last Saturday, a glorious spring day during a walk in Riverside Park from 59th to 87th Street, the noise from tourist helicopters was continuous. At times, four tourist helicopters were in view, chopping up and down the Hudson River. I reached out to friends and neighbors who I discovered were equally disturbed, but did not have a voice of, or plan of action about this. We, the Conservancy, have begun to organize the park organizations, park users, and residents from Brooklyn Heights to Hamilton Heights. This will include the Hudson River Park, Battery Park, City Park, High Line, and the new park on the Brooklyn waterfront. We have gotten energetic responses from residents of Lincoln Towers and other co-ops along the waterfront. It was only by chance that we learned yesterday of this hearing. You can be sure that if we had more time, you would be hearing from many other angry and upset constituents. We urge the council to take all necessary measures to insist that Mayor de Blasio cancel the license on this obnoxious and dangerous use of the skies of New York City. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Mike Gannon. I'm president of Douglas Manor Association. 
and we support uh, Resolution 178-218. The Douglas Manor Association is a homeowner association representing 595 families in Northeast Queens, community of Douglas Manor, a peninsula of land jutting out into Little Neck Bay and Long Island Sound at the Queens and Nassau County border, being tr long troubled by helicopter noise. Our community receives the brunt of the traffic as helicopters enter and leave the FAA's North Shore route at the Nassau line, while the noise and disruption to our uh, quality of life peaks on Friday and Saturday, or Friday and Sunday, during the summer vacation time period, it also remains a year-round problem. Please support the resolution which extends the North Shore route westward to include Queens County. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Council, for giving me an opportunity to speak today. My name is Joseph Swartz, and I've worked and lived in Lower Manhattan since 2003. The family is simply shocked and outraged that their son drowned to death in this manner in what was supposed to be a pleasurable sightseeing helicopter tour, said attorney Gary Robb regarding the death of 26-year-old Trevor Cadigan. Richard Vance, the Liberty helicopter pilot, failed to keep control of the helicopter, causing it to crash into the East River, killing all five passengers. The pilot, Mr. Vance, was the only survivor. In 2009, a sightseeing helicopter of the same model and operated by the same company as the one in Sunday's wreck collided with a small private plane over the Hudson River, killing nine people, including a group of Italian tourists. A crash in October 2011 in the East River killed a British woman visiting a city for her 40th birthday and two other passengers. A helicopter on a sightseeing tour of Manhattan crashed in the Hudson River in July 2007 shaking up the eight people but injuring no one. In June 2005, two helicopters crashed in the East River in the same week. One injured eight people, injuring some banking executives. The other hit the water shortly after takeoff on a sightseeing flight, injuring six tourists and a pilot. On this latest crash, Brian McDaniel, a fighter fire and first responder from Dallas who understood emergency situations, was killed. While the passengers were not able to remove their harnesses, and were still strapped in when found at the bottom of the river, it's very likely most or all would have perished, even if the harnesses had been disengaged. The recent ruling banning open door helicopters is a travesty and will prevent further deaths from future helicopter crashes. The city and its residents are vulnerable as the helicopter viol pilots violate FAA regulations consistently by numerous violations that I've even noted flying directly over several buildings in my neighborhood. I also noted pilots fly very low levels when it's overcast due to low cloud ceilings. They practically hover above the buildings they fly so low, much lower than the 900 minimum requirement. A noise at that level is deafening. I've seen Liberty helicopters hovering in place on many occasions long for more photography of the World Trade Center, which I believe is also a violation. I've seen tourist helicopters when returning on their flight coming down south the river to fly to the east side of the river to allow tourists to get additional pictures of the World Trade Center. I've counted as many as 106 flights going by my building in a 60 minute interval. Those flights going both north and south up the Hudson River. Please understand residents in Battery Park City and Lower Manhattan can hear those loud helicopters when they're flying on the east and the west sides of the river, both ways. Think about it, 106 flights in 60 minutes. There wasn't one minute, one second of silence. I heard the noise of helicopters for that entire hour. I'm forced to close my windows as the noise is sometimes so deafening. We need to prohibit all tourist helicopters from flying over the city. Mayor de Blasio received 205,000 in campaign contributions from Liberty Helicopter and the Helicopter Association. Follow the money. How many more deaths will it take? I'm not talking about noise council people, I'm talking about deaths, people dying because of tourist helicopters out of Pier 6. And can can campaign contributions and jobs that may cost are not even close to being worth the lives of so many. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe, and thank you everyone to the panel. Uh, what I just say is I think unified is the message. So no matter where our complaints are coming from, whether it's Queens, Manhattan, Brooklyn, um, part of the goal of today was to unify the opposition from all sides so that we don't just tackle one side of this problem. It's a problem that's affecting whether we're living on downtown Manhattan, whether it's Brooklyn, whether it's Queens, whether it's Douglaston, um, the residents of Manhattan. This is a plague that we're looking at right now. So thank you. So our last panel um, is... Okay. 
So if we can all kind of see if we can grab two more chairs for the, for the panel. It's Sherry Campbell from To Ban Tour Helicopters, a good title. <laughs> Marie Timmel from the West 88th Street Block Association. Lena Tuma from 70 Battery Place. And John Grelnick. Um, right? And Michael Rychak, sorry. Stacy Shub. Sorry, Stacy. <laughs> <laughs> I kept flipping over one more. Thank you. Thank you to Councilmember Machaka for staying and Councilmember Chin for making it through the whole hearing. Thank you very much. So maybe we'll start, Stacy, we'll work our way over. I think we lost two, so maybe we can slide into the middle. Thank you. I think just make sure your red light is on. There. Red light's on. There you, you go. Thank you. I've lived at the South Street Seaport for over 20 years. I hear them, I see them, I feel them, and my family breathes their fumes. Councilmember Chin, thank you for negotiating a trial of reduced flights. It served the purpose of showing that even cutting flights by 50% was imperceptible. It's still miserable. I'll challenge the operators even further on the supposition regarding the incremental financial benefit to the city. Even the few millions of dollars assumes that tourists came here with money in their pockets, specifically earmarked for only helicopter tours. I guarantee you that if they stop, they'll hitch a water taxi, go to Governor's Island, go to the top of the Trade Center, or maybe go to TKTS. And conversely, it also supposes that the money that was spent with them couldn't have otherwise been spent on some other safer tourist attraction. I hate to be a naysayer, I solve problems for a living, but tourist helicopters are incompatible in a densely populated city of skyscrapers. Even with all of the suggestions that I was listening to sitting here, going electric, monitoring, social media, reining in rogue pilots, stage three, government mandates, fly only over water, there's still too much inherent misery and risk will persist that outweighs the small perceived financial benefit. As I was sitting here in the back listening to the back and forth, it reminded me of trying to figure out a safe way for a baby to play in traffic. Should we put up signs, construct a barrier, tweet when an oncoming car is coming? They're the wrong questions to ask. How about just pick up the baby and don't let them play in traffic? Here's why. Because even if you were able to do everything that you were suggesting, we'll still have unnecessary noise, unnecessary carcinogens. If we could eliminate the noise and get the fumes down, which is a huge if, we'll still have vibrations. I feel the helicopters. Even through my windows, I feel them. Reverberating off of the buildings, it kills me. We still have a danger to the passengers as evidenced by the recent crash. But even more important is the danger to people who didn't choose to be on the helicopters. The non-passengers, either by an accident or what hasn't been mentioned that I heard of, intentional. Is a helicopter not more vulnerable than the cockpit of a closed airplane? Do you know that on the roof, on Peck Slip, there's a school where school children play every day, Monday through Friday, in shifts? They are only a half a block off of the water. Even quieter, less polluting helicopters with a path over the water would still take their lives if it veered a half a block instead of going down in the river. Would the injury through inhaled fumes, accent, intentional downing of a helicopter be worth this unnecessary tourist attraction? I was here September 11th. My daughter was walking home from school the day the van intentionally went up on the sidewalk downtown. I'm acutely aware of the risks I choose to take by living here. But I go back to you, is this unnecessary risk worth it? Thank you. Thank you. And what you were doing all day. Thank you. Back to you. Hi, I'm Marie Tamal. I represent the West 88th Street Block Association and also myself. I'm a longtime resident of the Upper West Side and I've long enjoyed our parks. The best thing that ever happened in Manhattan was Hudson River Park. Before 9-11, when it first opened, I was one of the first people out on that bike path. Now, all of Hudson River Park has a helicopter running up the coast every six minutes. Every six minutes. And I want to make it clear about noise. Noise has two components, 
First is decibel, and second is vibration. It's vibration that is killing us. Mm -hmm. If you feel it going over your house, it's scary. Hudson River Park not only is an oasis for New Yorkers who are weary of construction and noise, our parks are the only places where we have serenity. Our parks are being ruined by air tourism, and our parks are one of our greatest tourist attractions. People come from all over the world to see Central Park. I mean, I complain that it's overrun with tourists, but why are the tourists in the air more important than the tourists in the park on the ground? They're being disrupted too. Hudson River Park has people driving in from out of town to use it. The second point I want to make is there is, I don't know if it's air tourism or charter flights, there is a de facto air helicopter corridor right now between 86th and 90th Street running from west to east. And a lot of it is the draw of the Central Park Reservoir. Again, a place that's a tourist draw and a place of serenity. And there are helicopters over the uh, reservoir all the time now. And they're running over my house all the time. And I think they're chartered because they tend to be Friday evening and Sunday evening. Finally, these pilots are rogue. I see them over the land. I observe them. I've been looking at this issue since early 2014 when I wrote Bill de Blasio and all my representatives to stop air tourism. I'm concerned about the dangers of air tourism as well. When I wrote Bill in um, April of 2014, I wrote, I noted, that the NTSB, the National Transportation Safety Board, wrote a white paper in January 2014 about the dangers of helicopters. In the white paper, they stated that um, helicopter accidents were at unacceptably high levels. Since 2004, more than 1,600 accidents occurred involving helicopters and um, there were more than 500 casualties. And of course, since 2014, that has gone up. The NTSB called helicopters in that white paper inherently unstable vehicles. And they're running right over my house. It's like terror from the air. And, and you know, when I hear this stuff, it scares me. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, John Gronick, a resident of Battery Park for the last seven years. I'd really like to say, you know, in, in terms of the helicopter issue, I haven't noticed any meaningful change in the last several years. It continues to be a significant issue from a noise perspective, a pollution perspective, and from a safety perspective. And I think one of the things that's a little bit of a misconception is we continue to talk about, you know, the issues with the a helicopter or the noise from a helicopter. But in reality, if you sit out there on the park, it's usually four to six at any one point in time. So, you know, it's really this, you know, combination of living next to an aerial highway or a war zone, depending upon the way you look at it. I think the other thing that is often raised is really the economic impact. And I think, you know, some of my friends here have raised similar points. You know, I think one of the things that really needs to be studied is what is the true economic value of this? as opposed to these individuals spending money at One World Trade, a museum, a dinner, uh, a variety of other things. I feel like the economics always assumes this is the sole purpose of the visit, when in reality that's probably slim to none of the individuals that come to New York City. So any analysis that comes from the economic development group should really highlight what is the incremental money that New York City is going to lose and what is that relative to the value of the residents that continue to have safety, noise, pollution issues you know, over the next several years as this contract continues to go on despite you know, concerns of the residents. Because in my opinion, we're the ones who truly matter. We provide more economics to the city than all these tourists. Thank you. I think that was probably one of the most stark points that came out of today's hearing, was hearing that two to three million number. We all looked at each other and said, well, what the hell are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, this, this, this is what we're fighting over? Right. I mean, I, I was immaterial. waiting to hear that they're constructing the west, a new West Side Highway with the money, and not with, not with this type. And I think when you mentioned the parks, too, I, I know you're going to speak. Um, George can tell you, when you go from McNeil Park and College Point to Third Avenue to Francis Lewis Park to Crocheron Park to Fort Totten to Douglaston Bay, every one of those communities feels exact same pain that you are. And, and you know, we chose this city to live in. We're paying the highest taxes in the world 
to live here. Um, and you, you start feeling the frustration with everything building, saying, how much more can we take? And when we're willing to take our fair share, when somebody puts a plan in front of us and says, there's a reason why we need to do this, and here are the reasons. We didn't get that today. Uh, we didn't get anything to make me feel like going home saying, all right, we, we can work out a plan. I mean, because of the passion and everyone that came forward, we as the council members are, are hearing that even with the plans that we're talking about, it's, it's, it's not even enough. We gotta start, because I don't wanna let anybody walk from any industry to think that they're not gonna do anything. So we gotta start this and keep this momentum going as to the entire city is unified against this because nobody's really asking for it. And any tourist that comes here, never, friends of ours that come and visit our homes, no one ever said, gee, I had a great helicopter tour in New York. That's, nobody's ever said that, right? I mean, uh, who, who comes to us saying, I'm coming to the greatest city in the world because I had a helicopter tour? It's just not happening. So go ahead. I, I didn't mean to cut you over. I, no, everyone no, was, was in there. I wanted to thank you all. I'm Michael Reichek. I live in Brooklyn. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. I I think oh, is your okay. mic on? Sure. I'm Michael Reichek. This is my first meeting ever like this. That's well, so, I, so thank you. And uh, the point I'm here, the reason I'm here is because this point means so much to me. I lived in Brooklyn Heights now for 30 years, and the last I don't know how many years, it's just a constant drone of the helicopters, as other people have attested to. And I had heart surgery a little while ago, and even at home, you still, want the windows shut, you still hear and feel the helicopters. And then you're like, okay, well, I want to get outside. So you go to the promenade, or you go down to the Brooklyn Bridge Park, and somebody just said war zone. It really feels at points like it's a war zone down there. So I just wanted to say I uh, empathize and appreciate your work on doing this, and I really think the only solution is just to really you know, ban the ban tourist helicopters. So thank you so much. We can all finally do that. Councilmember Chin, any closing comment? Thank you, Chair. Really, and thank you all for coming out today. I mean, the, the amount of frustration in the past couple of years, we feel it because we also live down there. And as I said earlier, um, two years ago, in a way, we were forced into a position where we got to get some immediate relief. But I think as this issue is expanding, it's, it's not just lower Manhattan, it's all over the city. So if we can all band together, I think we have enough to say that it's not worth it. It's not worth it. And they still, Chair, they have not given us the, the economic impact because they try to lump everything together. I think we have a very, very strong argument to really force the city, enough is enough, not worth it, we got to stop it. I agree. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, everybody. I think we all get a one, one giant applause for that. And, <laughs> and th I think we learned that we're also unified. And that was purpose of really I wanted to do this. It wasn't just about tours and, and charters. It was all of us saying, hey, the work that was done two years ago, let's expand it, let's grow it, let's ban it if we can, but let's take the steps to get where we need to go. Thank you, everyone. We are adjourned.
Test, test. This is a committee hearing on juvenile justice joined with justice system. Today's date is April 18, 2018, being recorded by Sergeant at Arms, Edwin Lopez.